Shack on a hill in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop. We are live on the Fringe FM. I hope you guys had a good weekend. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. It is Monday night, November the 4th, the day and night of the moon as we move on into the 5th. And tonight, we're going to welcome back Ian Wilson. And where we left off on our last conversation that we had with Ian is he talk to us about beings of light and then we let the conversation go so we're going to pick up right where we left off now keep in mind that this guy has spent probably more time in the dream world than anybody you've ever met uh i don't know maybe jm deborg could come close but beings of light that's what we're going to be talking about tonight and wherever else the conversation goes also uh this show is brought to you by get the tea.com make sure you get the tea not just brought to you by get the tea. go get it get the tea.com Stay cleansed. It's sick. There's a bunch of icky, sticky, yucky going around right now. And keeping yourself cleaned out and probably taking some Allison along with it's going to go a long ways to keeping you from getting there. Plus, it'll help you with those nasty intruders. Also, ancientlifeoil.com, preparewiththefringe.com, and Optics Planet at www.thefringe.fm forward slash optics. So you can go get your telescope or night vision goggles. Go get that stuff. Tell them we sent you. I hope you guys had a happy Halloween. We had, like, a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun here. Uh, I want to give a big, big congrats to Alex Exum for what he did on Halloween. Man, that was epic. It was probably some of the best audio production I've ever heard. Um, and he used a binaural, I think it's like a 3D binaural microphone to record that um, at the Queen Mary and uh, studio out there. And that was something else. I don't know if he put it in the archives or not, but... I'm kind of uh, sad that Halloween's over, but now it's Krampus time. For all of you guys that are Christmas stooges like me, then we can just focus on Krampus, right? That's what we'll do. I mean, everybody's already playing Christmas music. I went up the road, and they already got that stuff going. That's depressing. When you hear Christmas music, Halloween's barely over. Um, anyways, if you want to donate to the website, please do. Go to lightingthevoid.com. We can use it right now. we got a lot of stuff going on this month. There's a donate button at the bottom of the website or grab some swag. We got some more pictures to put up, by the way. Uh, Willie from Philadelphia put his up. Then we've got Amanda's picture to put up. And we've also got another Dirty Bacon. Dirty Bacon's picture's up there. We've got to put that up. Eventually, we're going to have a collage of Void Walkers. And what I want is 50 Void Walkers of 50 states. I want at least one T-shirt on the map everywhere. And we're getting close. I mean, we're getting real close. Also, another thing that we're getting close on is the archives. The archives are going to have... The, um, the membership archives, commercial free. Also, there's going to be some other things that I'll go ahead and tell you about that's going to be on there. Uh, I'll tell you some, <laughs> somebody's like, oh, you're a Scrooge. Yes, I'm a little bit of a Scrooge. Some other things is 
I'm going to do like a big thing on tarot, and this is going to be a tarot, kind of like a class, but it's one that you've. That's going to be very extensive, very extensive. So I think it'll be worth it. There'll be other stuff on. I can't give it all away yet, but people have been asking about the membership archives. People have been asking about, man, I will pay you this much to get rid of the commercials or whatever. So, you know, I get it now. we got to have it. Dan's been helping in the background. The Reverend Dan Lopez has been helping in the background working on that. So that'll be there soon. And all the people that donate as well that help out will will have that membership as well. Um, and if you're into ufology, which most of you are, there's a lot of big information coming out about Elizondo. Still yet quite not the truth that we're getting from these people, right? All this stuff keeps ending up to be more and more BS. If you want to follow the story there, go to ufoseekers.com, which is backed in support of us and lighting the void. Follow them on Twitter at ufoseekers, youtube.com forward slash ufoseekers. Give them a call if you've had a sighting, 661-UFO-7889. You know, um, I'm not surprised about that, actually. And I can tell you the more that this, this stuff comes out, the more the story comes out on these people. Um, it's always going to be what I said. You know, they're just giving us a little bit of information. It's all a setup. I'm sorry. It just is. I don't think it is what other people think it is when it comes to disclosure, but I don't want to go down that road tonight. We're going to talk about these lion, uh, lion. I was still thinking about them. Lion UFOsters. No light beings with Ian Wilson. And if you hadn't heard of Ian Wilson, he's been on the program and the website for reference tonight is you are dream. You are dreaming.org. And in 1986, at the age of 14, Ian had a first encounter while with a small group of people during the Perseid meteor shower. And following that encounter, Ian started to explore a state known as lucid dreaming. And in 1987, and has exploited and has explored consciousness during sleep for over 32 years. Now, that's a long time. He's the author of five books entitled You Are Dreaming, The Theory of Precognitive Dreams, Deja Reve, A Course on Consciousness, and Living a Dream That Lasts a Lifetime. The last time you were on the show, Ian, you almost fell asleep in Dream World with us here in Late Night Radio. I hope that you're stocked up and prepared are you still out in the woods by the way i am and i got a nos energy drink i slammed that back just before you called me so hopefully that's going to do the trick yeah so you're not going to stay I in there would have tried to have a nap <laughs> but you know my lifestyle is busy my work keeps me really busy commuting every day i do about three hours of driving it's so fun but yeah. you know that's real life for you grinding worse than world of warcraft yeah it is man it sucks out there doesn't it all the greed and all the stuff going on Oh, it's, good to it's get terrible away. what we've done to ourselves. It's good to get away. <laughs> Last time when we got off the air, you were staring at like a coyote or something, and that's how you're just out in the woods talking to us. That's right, and sometimes bears can walk by. It's a nice little spot, but um, I do jo enjoy getting out into nature. I think it's just a nice break away from all the artificial surroundings that we put ourselves in, and it mm. kind of makes me connect a little bit more just to – you know, the more natural aspects of ourselves. And I think uh, it's just a part that I don't like to miss out on it. Uh, it always is a place that I like to go and find serenity and peace and just, you know, just get a better sense of yourself when you're uh, not being distracted by all the distractions that we surround ourselves with. Amen to that. I like to go out in the woods and do all kinds of stuff, actually. When I go out there, I like to be perfectly still and see how close I can let a squirrel get to me before it realizes that I'm not a tree, you know, that kind of stuff. That's what I usually do, but I'm weird like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I love watching any sort of wildlife out in nature, you know, from ducks on a pond to eagles hunting fish. I mean, well, the world we live in is an amazing world. It's, it's rich with such natural beauty, and it's a shame that we're trashing it all at this point in our history because it shows a real lack of respect for the planet uh, in place of artificial things like money where now, money has more value than life doesn't when life right. is the only thing that really does have value in this world, but it gets treated like crap, you know, and that just comes from this ego that drives us. But I'm not yeah. saying everybody's that way. But well, you, you know spend I mean. most of your time, well, a lot of your time in the dream world and part two of our conversation tonight, I wanted to pick up where you left off where you said you had uh, some encounters with light beings. Now, we I've heard this before, light beings, but I think you were... I think you were talking about something a little bit different and it just raised my curiosity. And I'd kind of like to pick back up there and maybe talk about, um, well, let's let everybody first know that, you know, you're a dream expert or quote dream explorer and you write extensively about this on your website, but 
that you encountered these things. And can you kind of start me off about your first encounter with these light beings and how this happened? Well, you're going to love this one, Joe. So my first encounter with a being of light didn't take place in this lifetime. It took place after I had died in a war. I got my head blown off. It was quite fun. And uh, so, wow. as you can imagine, a lot of us come into this system and we're pretty mind wiped. And we'll get into that. But I've always known this goes way back to like, I'll have to explain it. So I came into this lifetime from another lifetime. And from what I can piece together from the fragments, because I went through the same process that we all go through, but I fought like hell because I didn't want to come back here. So we'll start where I can start on that memory. Leaning over a trench, looking down a bolt action rifle, it had the old, you know, flip rifle sights. And something happened to me. And uh, I pieced it together quite a long time after because at that time, whatever happened killed me. So I heard what I thought was water dripping by my left ear. And my peripheral vision collapsed to a single point, and that was death. And so all of a sudden, I found myself now being ejected from that body because now it's deceased. And I stood there looking at the battlefield in a state of afterlife shock. Hmm. So, you know, when I came out, I didn't know what was going on. So I'm looking there, and all of a sudden, this being of light comes down from the sky. And I'm not really processing information too well. I'm not used to being in that space. And you go from being so immersed in that experience to suddenly being in this new focus state. Uh, stuff that I know now, but back then, no idea about. And the being of light simply just emits this energy and it's almost like a tractor beam and drags me up through these layers. And it just tells me straight up, you've died. And then I see these other people there and he says those people as well have passed on and they're just processing. And so I don't really know what to make of it because I'm still in a state of shock. So we kind of walk around and it takes me to this other location. And now I'm standing what I think is water. And uh, as far as I can see, it's just like blank, empty space. So there's no stars, but it just stretches on forever. And so kind of in that state, we still emulate our body. So it's just like being in a dream, how you, you have your dream body, right? So I yeah. have hands and I'm sort of replicating that former life. <clears throat> so anyways, I put my hand in the water and I pick up these, what look like translucent little cells are about dime sized and I don't know what to make of it, but they give off this energy, almost like sunlight and magnetism. I drop it back in the water. And then the being turns to me and says, like you, they too are awaiting to return to life. And that's when I came out of the shock. And I, and I realized what it was going to do, right? <clears throat> so I'm like, wait a second, because it was going to send me back to earth. I was like, I don't want to go back there. It's crazy down there. Everybody's killing everybody. I don't want anything to do with it. And the being just simply says, well, this time it's going to be different. And it opens up this fractal, swirling fractal portal. It's the only way to describe it. It's almost like a Mandelbrot set, but it's more like a Mandela. Mm -hmm. And uh, just almost like force pushes me into it. And when I hit that, that's when it tries to strip away all of the memory and just it's complete ego death. So I call that the second death, which you know, a lot of people don't even realize that we go through that to come into the system because here it's 100% total immersion. So from that perspective, it felt like I was being erased. And down this tunnel I go. And I open my eyes in a new body. And I must be a baby because it's my first memory coming into this lifetime. And I see this woman with black hair leaning over top of me, you know, looking at me. So I must have been a baby in a chair and she's tucking the blankets around me. So I close my eyes. And I go right back up through the tunnel, right back to the being. And now I'm pissed off. I'm like, why did you send me back? I didn't want to go back there. It's crazy down there. Everyone's killing everybody. And the being says, well, this time it's going to be different. And it pushed me back through the tunnel, back into the new body. And my mom said for the first year, I was the loudest crying baby she ever had. But this off. process of <laughs> fighting, yeah. Yeah. coming back into this lifetime, lasted until I was five years old. So during that time, I was reliving the memories and the trauma of dying over and over again in my dreams. My mom remembers me telling her stories of that. And, and she would tell me, well, son, that's just, that's just a dream, right? So, you know, and this is now more when I'm around two years old and I'm starting to develop language again. And she also said that I was the quickest in the family to start to speak because in my former life, I was British and I had my language was English. So it was kind of nice in that segue. 
So it came back pretty comfortably for me in this lifetime. So suffice to say, that was a really, really messed up period for me from the up till the age of five because now, now what I was war having, were you in? Did you could you identify the war like based on yeah, your surroundings? Yeah, I'm pretty confident based on the memories that I've been able to piece together because when you hit that blender, I call it the blender going through that tunnel, it shatters. It's like being glass and just shattering to all these millions of little pieces and, and having a fragmented mind, right? So a lot of the auto, audio was gone. It was now images and it was like, I could see the face of my father. I could see the face of my mother, but I couldn't remember the names. I could see my uncle did have a barber shop and I remember we would play cards on the table out on the sidewalk. And other little fragmented memories, like when I was going off to war, I was on a train and I had a little small fo- black and white photo album, pictures of my family. And I remember looking at my face and it's one of the few memories that I have of what I looked like. And I remember looking in the reflection in the glass and because I was going off to war, I just felt like I was a ghost looking at myself. So I was pretty depressed, very unhappy, it's scared. Like World War II? Is that what, no, is that what it was? World, World War I? Okay. It was World War I, yeah. And, and it's, that's no surprise to me now from what I know. Um, but suffice to say, like that period um, was my first encounter with this being of light. Now, it's going to play more of a pivotal role when I start going into the lucid dreaming at the age of 15. But it also played a role at 12. But there's a few more weird oddities that took place during my childhood in trying to adjust into this lifetime. Because um, during that time, I really struggled with the knowing that I existed before this lifetime and that something had happened to me, and there was a lot of confusion. So that former part of myself was pretty latched on, but not letting go, right? And uh, as a child, I had these really weird visions. And for example, I'd sit in bed awake, and suddenly it would be like a portal opened up in my wall, and all these, you know, ghosts would start walking across uh, my room. And it would happen almost every night. It was just one of those many weird things. But to really make it weird, my sister sat with me one time and she saw them. And she's never forgotten that. That freaked her out. And she was pretty young at the time because that process kind of continued. It was almost like a pilgrimage. I know what it is today. But back then, I was just a kid. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was weird. I didn't know what to think of it. I was just a child. And, uh, you know, they'd wave at me, some would pat me on the head. And uh, to fast forward to when I kind of figured it out now, all it was was these were people, beings that I interacted with in other lifetimes that were just wishing me well in this one. So it was just kind of like, a, you know, here, you're back again and good luck and you know, we'll just wait for you when you return on the other side, you know. So, that's so kind these, of, um, these light beings are more like uh, uh, helpers to help people pass from one life to the next or some kind of helper, it seems like. Um, It can appear that way for sure. I mean, because we have this split in our time here, as you know, we become a deeply immersed character in this story. So all we know is this, you know, it's immersion, right? We become 100% immersed as a human. And our knowledge, because it's stripped from us, is based now on our culture, what people have taught us, and what we learn here in this locality. So all we tend to know is just what's here, and we don't really know what's out there. And that's why it becomes the unknown to us. Right. So, but to wrap up this part of the story, um, at the age of five, I remember looking at myself in a mirror at my parents' house. They built their first house in Penticton on Greenwood drive. And I was standing in the bathroom looking at the mirror. And I remember my former self looking at myself now as a kid and just finally said, okay, I'm finally this kid. I'm going to just have to accept it and move on. And it let go. And it was almost like feeling in presence of a shadow behind me that just kind of just stepped back into the ethers. And once that happened, all of the experiences, all of the memories and everything just dimmed and was gone. Like I just suddenly was released from all of that and just became your typical five-year-old kid and just moved on. You know, like what the heck was that? I don't know. I'm just a kid, (laughs) you know? So a really weird effect there on how that kind of played a role in shaping the foundation for what would then become a lot of self-edification and rediscovery once I got older. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So this is something cool to me because I've had a couple of, well, I've had a couple of, uh, dreams about the civil war. I've, I've had a couple of 
uh, readings that kind of inter, you know, intertwined with that. I've had my cousin come on here once, <clears throat> Ian, and tell me uh, about a dream, and it's really cool. You know this, man. It's really cool when people in your life that normally don't talk about these things, they won't talk about it. But now that they know you talk about it, they'll pull you to the side and That's right. talk about it. And he came on the air here, Zach, he's in the military, and told me about how he died on a horse leading his men into battle. And he said, I could feel the, uh, he said, you know, I, I could feel the shot. And he said, when I got shot, I could feel the, um, the grass. He said, I could feel the horse on me. I could feel the grass. I could smell the dew. He said, I remember grabbing the grass and squeezing it. And he said, all I remember was feeling like, um, the disappointment that he thought that he was going to be okay. And then when he did that charge, he realized immediately that he had led his men into slaughter and that's all he could think about before he died. But he didn't remember where he went and see, it makes me wonder because you're doing these practices is that when you pass away this time, if you're going to transition easier or be like, okay, yeah, I've done this before and remember, so to speak. Yeah, I've been, you know, you know this is a, a thing that I tell very few people, uh, but because we're having this discussion when, when it does come around to it, I say, you know, one thing to know about me is, you know, it took dying in my last lifetime to really wake me up in this one. So I don't treat it as a joke. It's not a belief that I have, right? This is all part and parcel of the beginning of my lifetime. And I, I can assure you in trying to tell people this, including my parents, I mean, my mom's okay with it, but my father's not. Got me kicked out of church. You know, it's not something that's very popular to open your mouth about and talk, especially as a young kid, because, you know, you try to engage with anybody to try to get validation or understanding or information or anything that can help you process that type of an experience to only find out people don't know shit. <laughs> you know, right. they, are, yeah. they are just as bad as you are in terms of, but we're going to get into all of that. So just a few more quick little points on that. That um, So my mom just not too long ago, I, was, I brought up this topic about the, the spirits walking through the walls and how weird that was. And she goes, you know, that's so funny you say that because when you were a baby, um, you were screaming and just screaming at the top of your lungs and your father went racing into that room. And he, when he opened the door, he saw them too. And it scared the living crap out of him. And he never talked about it again. So not just my sister, but my father. And I didn't know that until almost two years ago that that uh my mom well, and him had a discussion right that has to make you feel Isn't good bizarre yeah well the thing with me is like i've met another person who's had that experience so that's kind of a thing with me like i'm all about direct experience like i think it's good to be honest even if it's weird because you'd be amazed how many other people actually have these types of experiences and then when they finally hear somebody talk about it they go oh my god i've been through that too i remember that from my childhood so it doesn't hurt to put it out there even though it's not a popular thing because it kind of disrupts a lot of the quote unquote belief systems that we're all suffering from while we're in this focus state. And trust me, you know, as well as I do, just, that's a many, that's a big symptom of a problem that's going on around here is belief. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, belief shapes everything in our life. And it, it and from what I understand from other out of body experience, people and uh, astral travelers like William Buhlman is that our beliefs will also shape our and you can help me with this too. We'll also shape our after death experience Absolutely. as well. And we'll get into that. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important while we're here in this sojourn, experiencing what it's like to be human, that we try to, because there's four things that I work on that I've identified as the problems that face us. The first is amnesia, right? And that amnesia comes in from that mind wipe. So that's when you get your slate cleaned. The second thing is immersion. And that's when while you're here, now you're going to start becoming immersed where all you know is here. You don't know any of this other information because you don't have any more access to that. It's been cut off. The third thing is belief in the place of knowledge. And that's very common. It, all throughout history, that's been a challenge for all of humanity, is that we tend to not know. And when we don't know something, an easier thing to do is just slap a belief in there because it seems to fit or it seems to make sense. And that's where that problem becomes something that needs to be worked on as well. And the last thing is a lack of love. So right. those four things are really kind of, if you're trying to come out of this state to have more access to your true self, um, those are the things that kind of get in the way. 
All right. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to get into this some more, too. Uh, if you guys want the website for references, youardreaming.org. We'll be right back with the Ian Wilson. Uh, you can also join the Fringe FM chat if you go to the fringe.fm and hit chat or you go to lightingthevoid.com. There's a Discord link there where you give me all the cool people and all the void walkers in there. We'll be right back with Ian Wilson. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on The Fringe FM. This is Corbin, son of the one and only Joe Root, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Did you know that qualified patients can access medical cannabis in all 50 states? Anasense is a medical cannabis collective that helps patients in all 50 states gain access to cannabis medication. Anasense does this with a streamlined process and strict compliance with the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, the Affordable Care Act, and the U.S. Constitution. It is important for each patient to understand the legalities involved, the costs, and the benefits of cannabis medication. Through truth, legalization, and education, the medical benefits of cannabis will to plant recreational perceptions and the real vision for change will be realized. Let the people and their personal doctors take control of their medical cannabis decisions before the greed of big business takes over. The tipping point for change is today and Canasense is ready to lead the charge and enable legal access for all qualified patients to medical cannabis through its proven system. For more information, go to thefriends.fm forward slash care or click the banner on the website today. You are listening to Joe Root and Lighting Void here on the Fringe FM. I think by now we can get the information. I love magic, and on Lighting the Void, each and every week, you will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listened to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the God look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, guys. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now to angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or to speak with a trained consultant, give angioprim a call at 954-882-7221. That's 954-882-7221. Okay. Here we go. Ancientlifeoil.com. Ancientlifeoil.com. Now, this is for CBD. Ancientlifeoil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? Ancientlifeoil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. Ancientlifeoil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, ancientlifeoil.com. It's ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. Ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. Ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your northern self and use your 10-speed gears and listen to them bubble. 
You could hear a Barry Crocker, I know Brussel, but he ain't no holy friar. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. From the kingdom of Arkansas, you are listening to Joe Root and Lighting Void here on the Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Youardreaming.org is the website. Ian Wilson is our guest tonight. This is part two of our conversation about the dream world, the dream world that he's been in for over 30 years. He's talked about light beings that he's met, light beings that are there apparently to kind of assist us as we pass through life. Although Ian seemed a little angry when he came back to Earth after you got your head blown off. So when you yeah, say that, yeah, when you say that, like you were angry, it makes me wonder what was this place like? What kind of feeling did you get when when you were there? Did it feel did you feel loved? Did it feel like you were at home? Did you feel more familiar than you do here? How did it feel? No, at the time it was cold. It was it was um, confusing. Uh, like I said, I was in a state of shock. So, you know, the transition from that lifetime to this one, and it was quick too. I didn't have much time to get my bearings as to what really was going on. So. Um, the time there would be nothing more than what I would experience in just a nighttime of sleep. It was very quick for the processing. So, um, and, and again, it's not like I had a choice as to where I was going next. It wasn't like, oh, okay, well, I get to go back. So, hmm, I wonder, wanna, I wonder who I want to be in that human experience. It was just, okay, you're going back. <laughs> and so that did bother me. And it's always kind of bothered me when I was younger because I didn't understand it. So, it took a lot of time to reconcile that experience. And fortunately, I was able to start going back to that later on in life because of becoming conscious during sleep. But I'll talk about the next encounter with the being of light, <clears throat> which happened when I was about 12 years old. And this is before, you know, I started going into being conscious again during sleep, which opened up the can of worms and brought back a lot of the amnesic fragmented memories of self and that's why I always encourage being conscious during sleep because now you can access things that normally while you're not there in in this deep immersion you just simply probably won't access like <clears throat> like what for example um just these memory threads of yourself in things like other lifetimes and whatnot become more accessible once you start to basically the best way to describe it is tra- traverse memories of yourself that go into the farther reaches of what you are as this larger entity having a lot of different types of experiences because I'm jumping ahead a bit further than I want, but the sure. in my exploration of it, um, I tried to find a beginning. So I was able to return to my entry point into the human experience before I even became a human. So this system here was already here before I arrived. So this is in a system that, you know, um, I started with. And then I tried to find what my origins was beyond that. And it was like just chasing a recursive infinite feedback loop, like there was no beginning. So from that point in my life, when I started getting deep into understanding it and reconciling it, um, I came to the epiphany that, you know, trying to find a beginning, that's just kind of a human concept. But when it comes to what we really are, the ones wearing these bodies, the ones that are wearing these masks, um, are just as infinite in the past as we will be in the future uh, because there's that immutable self, that one thing between lifetimes that doesn't change, right? Okay. Which is the the observer, the I am awareness or your sense of self. And not so much colored up by your personality, but the part of you that simply will not die and continues. So the whole idea so, of a, a beginning and an origin or an ending you felt when you were there or maybe kind of knew that that was only a human concept, that there's, right. there's just infinity, so to speak. That's right. Interesting. Brace for eternity. 
Okay. Well, I, I just was curious because you wanted to talk about, you know, tapping into things that we normally can't on our conscious state. And I, I feel like you don't know where you left off that after that. So hopefully you do. Do you? Um, oh, yeah. So I wanted to get into the next part of the conversation, which was the second encounter now. So now I've gone on and I've been, you know, parents send me to church and, you know, I start talking about some of these things. I never forgot about them. I just, they dimmed and I didn't make it a priority to think about. But when, you know, in, in church, of course, people talk about God as being a being of light. So I'll read it away. I'm connecting saying, hey, I met that. I, that's, that's that being of light potentially and, you know, coming in this lifetime. So I start bringing it up. But because I'm talking about it from another perspective of coming in from another lifetime, I find out, well, no, they don't, they don't buy that. Uh, they seem to think it's just a one-time deal. And, uh, so it actually got me kicked out of church in my teenage years. So no, but, but, eh, whatever, whatever, that's their problem. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Must've been but, a, ma- so the second, a majority vote, right? Oh, it really is. You get, you get picked on for sure. People just don't understand it. And that's why I generally just don't talk about it. You know, I wouldn't just bring this conversation up with anybody that I know or, you know, walk down the street and go, Hey, guess what? It just doesn't work that way here. Right. All right. So, so you had a, a second encounter. A, yeah. And this was an interesting one. Cause, um, I think this also helps start the start of rebuilding that relationship. And it took place while I was awake. <clears throat> so as the story goes, my parents had purchased a lot on a lake and they were building kind of like just a cabin that, you know, we could go to and just get away from everything. And, uh, my grandfather, he gave me a pellet gun because I was a good shot with it. So, you know, at that time, you know, we're going way back, you know, 35 years. Mm-hmm. Um, parents are like, yeah, just go out and shoot sparrows because they're a pest bird and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just a kid. I don't know any better. And uh, I go to this shed and the shed is old. It's abandoned and it's got this cow skull that's dangling over the door. And I decided I'm going to use that as target practice. So I start loading in good old pellets and shooting at it. And then I see the sparrow try to land on the top of the skull. And of course, I shoot it. <clears throat> and that triggered something. And all of a sudden, I started feeling this presence. And it was a very powerful presence, like something that you just know that something else is there. Like you just, it's inescapable. And this presence was basically this being of light now just kind of doing an intervention, right? And it was like, you know, why did you shoot that bird? And, you know, I'm a 12 year old kid and suddenly I'm getting this voice in my head and this, this, this feeling of something radiating through me. And I'm like, well, because it's just a bird, right? Like it's not a big deal. And the being's like, well, that bird had a life. And it was like, how would you like it if someone shot you and you wouldn't be able to see your mom, you wouldn't be able to see your dad. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to share in that life. And I was like, oh, and then it did something even deeper. It actually started to connect me to that bird. And, uh, <clears throat> it was a really powerful experience of empathy. So I could actually feel, it's really hard to describe, describe, but effectively it was like I could feel what I had taken or stolen from that, that that bird had a purpose and it had a family. And uh, so long story short, you know, and it even let me know, like, you know, the bird itself had a family and that kind of stuff. So once it kind of loaded me with that information and I started to cry, like I started to feel what I had done. So sure. it was a, a real powerful lesson as, for a kid um, because it was then I connected to the fact that even a bird has such a deep purpose here that most of us take for granted when we treat life the way we treat it. So I end up going to the skull and I could hear stuff in it and sure enough it had a nest in there and had babies and I had riddled the poor things with bullets and then I had to go with the trauma of dealing with that but suffice to say that day I got rid of the gun and I never hurt another animal again like that was it I was done I just and it made me a vegetarian for nine years fantastic see I know that feeling so, you know, my father used to take me hunting all the time and I'm pretty good at it but it's just I never could get over that feeling of killing an animal and watching that whole thing yeah just so yeah I can relate to that I could relate to that totally so, it was a very powerful lesson in empathy because, you know, I mean, it's nice because it wasn't like somebody here coming up to me and saying, Hey, you know what you did there was wrong. And it may not have been effective. Like maybe I would just be like, you're just some dude or whatever and ignore it. But this was a powerful lesson that transformed me and for the better. Right. I mean, in a, in a proper modification. So to get to the 
third encounter would be my first lucid dream. <clears throat> so my first lucid dream, and this is after I left, you know, read Dr. Stephen LeBurge's book. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, I'm in this dream and it's taking place where I live and I'm near this concession stand that's on the wrong side of the beach and it's in this park where it shouldn't be. And that helps with the um, reality check that I needed to realize that I was dreaming in the first place. So I go and there's nobody there at the concession stand and I wanted to buy some stuff. And because no one was there, I decided I'm just going to help myself. And I grab a package of M&Ms and this voice goes, isn't that stealing, right? So same voice, same being, <clears throat> but now just kind of working as a voice. And, and uh, so I think about it, I go, well, nobody's here. It's not stealing. And then I start thinking about it and I go, well, huh. it's a dream. And the being's like, oh, is it? Well, prove it. Right. And then I was left going, well, how do I prove that it's a dream? And no, that's no, when the I voice said, prove it. The voice said, yeah. prove it. Okay. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So it just kind of sat there and challenged me to that, you know, um, that whole self edification, that whole self realization that's required to become lucid. And, uh, and then when I did prove it, you know, it laughed. You know, I thought it was funny. It was like, you know, it was like, a, yeah, good for you, pal. You know, you did it. <laughs> Right. So I started the uh, started the whole journey into being conscious during sleep. Now, as a result, you know, I started having experiences with precognition and and these kind of things, and uh, I started getting a little bit deeper because I started now recognizing aspects of the afterlife, the aspects of those memories started kind of seeping back in, and so um, this being was kind of working with me, teaching me about dreams. So. You know, it would uh, present itself at first as a voice and it would teach me about how dreams are highly organized thoughts and how thought shapes the dream state and would give these amazing examples. And uh, when I was asking questions, it started to seem to provide really good answers. Like, for example, I was like, well, why do we have to die, right? And so it would do a simulation and suddenly, well, imagine the world had an immortal spider, right? So these things were really well, really intelligent, very logical, very rational, but wrapped up in this visual dream symbolism. So it starts off saying, imagine an immortal spider that gave birth to immortal spiders. And, you know, for each egg that hatches, that spider cannot die, but it still has to eat. And it too is going to, then it's going to have babies and more immortal spiders are going to be born. And, and it is a simulation. Yeah. And then you start watching, and then the whole earth gets just covered and everything gets consumed by these immortal spiders until the, it was just a completely unbalanced system. Right. And, and it was just a lesson on, hey, it needs to be balanced. And the same thing with things like another example of it showing me using dreams as a tool to, you know, give you kind of like a message or something to understand a problem. Like one of the things that I suffer from, and I think a lot of us do who go through these kind of things, I call it the grief of disbelief. Like, I mean, where nobody believes a word you say because it's just what it's like down here. One just thinks everyone's lying and making up stories and being disingenuous, but whatever. So here we go for a response to that. And the response was again done in a dream where I find, you know, this river and there's a quartz bed and in the quartz I find gold. So I'm of course, you know, and the gold, gold is representative of truth, right? So I pick up this chunk of gold and I'm just like amazed. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I, I found this gold and I want to give it to somebody to, to validate, right? So I go to another dream character and I pass it to him. But as soon as he takes it, it turns to fool's gold. Mm. And the lesson there was, these types of truths aren't necessarily given to another person by speaking about it. It has to come from within. It's, it's a process of self edification. They have to come to their own realization of truth. So certain truths aren't transmittable from one experience to another person. Right. Okay. And that's, so this, this, this is this, your third encounter, right? This one we're talking about. These are now? Starting, this is now getting into more of a blend of multiple encounters. And how old were you at this time? That would be probably around 16 at that time, yeah. Okay, all right. And that's also when all the, you know, the precognition and stuff started happening. And so, of course, like, my first lucid precognitive dream was, again, with this being of light. But uh, prior to that, just there was one big significant, significant encounter because um, when I started getting into that space, then I remember, just as I did as a baby, about that being a light, and I returned to it. So just as I did when I was being pushed in and I was having this whole conflict, I just remembered where it was and I just went there. And so now I'm seeing it. Now I'm not just hearing it as a voice. So it's there, it's radiant. And this time I'm not angry with it. I'm not fighting with it. And we're just having a conversation. So I ask it, you know, like, well, why did you send me back? 
and you know from that other lifetime and the being was instead of telling me why I said well, why do you think that was you know your only other lifetime right and then that's when it kind of just connected me to all these threads and all these memories and just a wave of lifetimes opened up and I started to remember them and it was like oh my god like just that vastness of it all right and it was now, a very powerful now you talk about powerful. the second death is that death um does that death cause you to lose the memory of who you were so to speak your identity here is that the, is well, that yeah i mean when we go through that process um it and, and again this is this is what i perceived that back then uh Back then, I thought it was like I was being deleted or erased. It's an ego death. It's the death of a personality, right? So that's why I call it the second death. But what it really is is that that memory is now just being compartmentalized and set aside. And it is accessible again. So all that memory is still there in this larger you, so to speak, but not necessarily being accessed or focused on to be recalled because most people simply just don't realize they, they have that and don't go looking for it. Um, or, or even in a space where they're not being bombarded by their senses to, you know, start to have the calmness and the focus to acquire a recall like that. But it's all, thankfully, it's still there. So, you know, my perception in the beginning was it was deleted. And now I realize it was really just stripping off a personality to make room for a new personality, a new experience, a new pattern of experience. And that's kind of how we roll, right? Um, <clears throat> so... Well, I don't yeah, know, when, but apparently if you're right, that's how we roll. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a little but, concerned. Uh, the only thing that, that it concerns me about, uh, because I've thought about this, I know we all have about death is I don't really necessarily think it's the death that scares people. It's the fact that you lose the memory of yourself, so to speak, like yeah. Ian Wilson no longer exists ever, period, again. And you'll never remember that. But what you're saying is, is that there is an accessible memory there yeah, based there on is. these encounters. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the good news because, you know, it's, it is very traumatic to come into these experiences, the way it affects us in our psychology or, or our knowing our sense of self, all that gets completely modified to this new life that we come into. And in that new life, it's all about that new life, you know, as you know, right? So it's all me, I'm here, it's this lifetime and it becomes the all important life for that time. Um, and that's just the way it is because, you know, each of us have to live and survive and experience and that's part of coming here and basically rolling an avatar and jumping into the experience of being human. So, gotcha. you know, we go through that life and then obtain all these experiences and, and you know, for for example, like you were saying, um, when I look at my first lifetime that I came into, the, the challenge is that when we die from that lifetime, it's that personality now, not your original self making the choices that affect the next lifetime. And that's where you can start getting a load and, you, and the next lifetime makes the next choice and the next lifetime affects the next choice. You see what I mean? It causes this chain of events where, um, we get so saturated by the human experience immersed in it, it becomes all we know. So we don't know and we forget all of this other aspects of ourself. And then we get in really deep. So we kind of descend down into addiction, like human addiction, human life addiction. And, and, and that's kind of the way it goes. And then you start to climb back out of it again. And that's kind of where I'm at in this lifetime, um, where you realize, oh, gee, I've got myself into something really deep. And nobody else is going to help dig me out of this hole. And it's not how the system works. So you start to self-edify. You start to acquire knowledge and you start dropping and shedding those beliefs. And the knowledge comes through direct experience. Ah, uh, gotcha. You, okay. You but you still trust, carry right? what, what we call uh, karma from life to life, so to speak. You're, yeah. That's what you're making these choices based on your ex experiences. Yeah. So, I mean, like, for example, in one lifetime, you can be a victimizer and guaranteed if you do really shitty things. Um, and then go back to that space, this, just like it did with the bird, it's going to then let you know what it was like to be the victim, the system. Oh my God. So that, karmic, yeah, yeah. And that's not a joke. People think it's forgiveness. You earn your forgiveness by changing yourself to be a better being. So if you're not yet a better being and you return there and you're not love, it spits you back out and that's it. You keep working at it and keep working at it until you become a being of quality. So <clears throat> other things 
in interacting with this being of light. I mean, there's a ton. I mean, we could talk about all these different types of dream scenarios, all these different types of metaphors that were shared. This lifetime, it was very accommodating for helping me reconcile. And and that's the different part. Remember it said it was going to be different? Right. That's yeah. what different was all about. It wasn't necessarily saying that life was going to be better or it was going to be greater, but it was going to be about coming into a larger knowing, to having access now to information that was lost along the way by being immersed into all these different lifetimes and um, having a higher understanding of the whole system that we are. So on the good news, so remember those cells that I was talking about, right, in this lake. When I went to the Monroe Institute about two years ago, and it's on my website, so if you went to the evidence page and clicked on the link to the Monroe Institute, you can read about it. One of the things that I encountered was I returned back to that lake. So I hadn't gone back for many, 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 many years. Actually, I haven't gone back to lake since I was deceased. So I, I finally got back to that place. But instead of finding these dim gray cells, which is kind of like the starting point for us, as far as I could see, stretching off into the end distances were beings of light. That, that was the evolutionary end game for us while we're here. So it was, and then it was, that's when I felt that love that you're talking about, you know, when you felt that perfection, that, that sense of, you know, what we're getting out of this experience. So So you, we, so we fell as a being of light and now we're trying to work our way back to be beings of light. Right. And here's, uh, here's kind of a cool kick. And this came around the age of 24. So now you can see, during this process from the age of, you know, 15 leading up to 24, I've had many, many, many encounters with it. I was working with it. The information it was giving was great. It knew a lot about me. So in this one final encounter with it, interfacing with it and talking to it, I came to this really profound epiphany. And I was like, wait a second. And I recognized that this being wasn't separate from me. And it was in, in that pivotal moment where I realized that it was me. That was my future self or my graduate self. And at that point, we kind of lost the dualism and just kind of merged. And that was the end of it. So at the age of 24, you know, I came to that encounter with it where it no longer became a relationship in dualism, rather a return to that's what I am and who I am as a non-physical being. So that's something that other people have also come into uh, for example, Joe McMonigle was told his story and same thing. He uh, came to that realization one time when he encountered it, but he was encountering it during a near-death experience and thought it was God and then realized that it was himself. Interesting. So, and so you had three. How many encounters did you have before the age of 20, you think? Oh, there was a lot. A lot of it was dealing with so much. Uh, how do we really explain it? Um Back during that time, you know, I was really curious and I just found that I could return there and ask questions and it just seemed to give me answers. And those answers weren't just, again, these metaphors that were there in the dream state. Some would be direct to this reality with a precognitive example, right? So um, there was just a lot. I mean, it became kind of like just this reunion or refriendship with something that, and I still at that time, I didn't really label it God. I didn't know what it was. I didn't even call it a guide. I just knew that it was kind of like a friend now and it was helpful. It was very informative. So, you know, why not keep trying to build this relationship, ask it questions and see what kind of answers I could get back from it. And a lot of it, again, was dealing with the nature of reality, the relationship between dreams and reality. And that's why my website's You Are Dreaming, because like, you know, I'm one of the very few people on the planet that quite confidently can say, well, we're in a literal dream world right now. And this is not a physical world. This is a rendered world um, that we're in. Speaking of rendering, I got a text in from a listener says, uh, these beings of light are these memories. The info is still there. Uh, Sounds like reformatting a hard drive. The access links are yeah. broken, but it's still there. That's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, and it's a, it's a, it's a real climb, Joe, to try to reorientate yourself into 
what we could say is higher consciousness, right? Because that's what we're evolving to is a higher system of consciousness or more, and it's love. It's more a more loving system. And that's why a lot of the stuff that I talk about with people, like what did I learn in all these dreams? Well, I learned empathy, I learned compassion, I learned kindness. And I also learned that we all came from a monolithic self. So our origin self can go back to oneness. We're just like a cell in the body. We all start at oneness, right? That oneness became many parts and those many parts form the whole and the whole that it formed is effectively the omniverse. So everything in this reality, everything in all the other realities that we're a part of, it's all still the self. And that's why, you know, I don't necessarily have a belief in God the way we have it here in most religions. I look at it as the self. So we don't separate ourselves from that relationship but we really are all interconnected, you know, in ways that we don't even realize or recognize while we're here. Um, We live in the illusion of separation while we're here. And that creates a lot of the, you know, while you're here, you have all the hate and all the judgments and all the ego driven stuff, right? And that kind of gets in the way of love. But fundamentally, I think if people knew that we were all effectively like cells in a body, we might treat each other better because we really are that interconnected. And it's not just with humans, it's with the entire cosmos. I mean, the, it, the I am awareness or that, that immutable self literally is reality, the universe looking through you, you know, okay. as um, a part of itself. That's, all right. So we'll, we'll pick back up after where we left off from here. This is fascinating stuff. I want to dig into this a little bit more because I got some questions. This is uh, Joe Roop. You're listening to Lighting the Void. Tomorrow night on the program, we're going to be speaking to a fascinating individual, a author, Alan Green. We're going to be looking at uh, some deeper hidden, hidden things in Shakespeare. We'll be right back with Ian Wilson. To call Joe, pick up the phone now, 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. Good evening, this is Art Bell, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. This is Crow Triple Seven, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. OMG, people are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your Super Strength Cleansing Tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Now, put power into your health now. So, getthetea.com, that's getthetea.com for super strength tea, and YouTube, Health Matters Now, that's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Getthetea.com, the tea that makes you go. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to the Fringe FM, and visit the website, thefringe.fm to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Root on The Fringe FM. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. This is Reverend John M. Polk. Please visit me at johnpolkmedia.com and visit my show, Quantum Hologram Matrix, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, every Tuesday on thefringe.fm. Hey, Fringe FM listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. 
No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to The Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Hola, French listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. From the afterlife and into your life, this is Art Bell, and you are listening to Joe Roop and Lighting the Void here on The Fringe FM. to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. Ian Wilson is our guest tonight. Uh, His encounter with the light beings, so far we've talked about three encounters with these light beings who are here to tell us uh, that we're here to come back to being a light being, apparently. It's fascinating stuff. I'm trying to put all this together in my head, Ian, and all i got to say is uh, I kind of feel like some of this is true. I'm not going to lie to you, uh, not not based on my experience, but based on the books I've read and the parallels I've put together with things like the Monroe Institute and other guests we've had on the program. The only question I'd have for you about this, Ian, is um, how come all these things happen to you and they don't happen to just ordinary people like me? You had some pretty fascinating stuff happened is it because you were at a certain time in your light cycle maybe i don't know yeah um the way i put it together like it's it's a really fascinating thing to come into this system and for example my first lifetime took place in about the 1970s era right so when we come into the human experience all everything's already here this is a real tough thing to get your head wrapped around um so the whole earth from its beginning to its end and all the probabilities of possible outcomes already exist as information. We're just interfacing with that data, having an experience, a very deep personal relationship with an era of time, an individual. So when we come back out of it, because of the way the rules are set up for this system to offer us this deep immersion, um, and so it doesn't influence other eras because it protects its genre, so to speak, right? Um, so you know, you, you can come back and go back and be a Roman soldier as long as you agree to the rule set and set aside your knowing and go right in for the full immersion. You'll have that Roman soldier experience. Now, from that Roman soldier perspective, you'll make the choice for the next lifetime or however that plays out. But the point that I'm making is that it's non-linear. You don't have to worry about time the way we worry about it here. Um, it's much like coming to a library now and you're reading books and now you're on chapter 16 or chapter 4,689,000, you know, big numbers. Because this universe deals with super big numbers as evident by when you look at the cosmos. And it's the same for yourself. You know, when you get into the deeper layers of what you really are, not what you've become, it really is something eternal. It really is something absolute. I mean, we're we're literally like a hologram where the part that we've become still contains the whole. But it's getting to orientate yourself into these different focus states to come into a knowing, not a belief uh, about yourself in this bigger picture. So for me, I think it's largely because I have gone through quite a lot of different lifetimes if that information is correct and i do believe eventually we come to a graduate lifetime and that graduate lifetime is most likely our candidate for our last sojourn into the human experience but that doesn't mean it ends there because it's a very big universe and there's a lot of different places to go and a lot of different places to see so you know i think it's all part of an evolutionary process 
and we're all going through it. So I don't consider myself special or different, but yes, it's just this lifetime it seems to fit that criteria of moving into more of a graduate study in the human experience rather than just the earlier kind of getting your toe wet and dealing with all the different types of emotionality and anger and fear and uncertainty and all these things that kind of get in the way. So, you know, um, like it said, this time will be different. And what it did offer in terms of the, those different promises, so to speak, are, are these types of insights, these types of experiences. Now, does this allow you to see into the future, so to speak, kind of like time travel, where, you, where it can help you make decisions so that you can progress faster, maybe? Well, I mean, it did save my life. We talked about that on the last show, how I was able to avoid being hit by a pickup truck with my daughter in the car. Yeah, the So it has picture, yeah. provided, yeah. So, I mean, it has in many respects been very helpful. Um, certainly hasn't made me, like, I mean, I'm just like, I'm an average Joe. You know, I really am. I, I don't, I don't live a rich life. I work hard. You know, I live paycheck to paycheck like everybody else and I'm not getting the silver spoon. There's no special treatment. The only thing that's really special is that you know, I can be conscious when I sleep. I can access other information. Um, that other information for me is intrinsic and valuable because it can thread me into, you know, um, an understanding of this bigger picture that we're all a part of. Um, so again, and, and you're talking to a person like I don't have this whole, it's all about me thing and an ego about it because it sure. really is all about us. This is us evolving together as a group and we're all working towards a higher quality of self, which does incorporate love, you know, because we can't return to oneness if we're full of hate, can't return if we're full of fear and full of judgment. These things are going to keep us at a lower state of consciousness and they're not privy to higher states of consciousness because we're not ready. That's, you know? you're so you right. have to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I got a text in on the text in line here from, again, that's funny. This guy says, you know, Bill Hicks put it pretty well. Every so often it comes along, someone comes along and says, hey, you know, this is just a ride. And then we kill those people. So it's probably, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a good thing that you're staying in dream world all the time instead of out in the public saying this stuff. But uh, I don't think, I th hopefully we're past all that now. Um, I hope so too. I mean, it's not a, not something that, you know, like I'm not preachy in anything that I do, which means I'm not going to say to you, oh, you have to believe me. It's so important because I know the truth. And no. For me, it's about you having the tool set, the cognitive tool set to start to self edify because these truths don't come, like I say, from me just speaking about them. They come from your own epiphanies, your own self realizations. And where you start to now evolve, grow up, and shed a lot of this lower consciousness stuff. Right. So it is, it is about growing up and evolving into, like we say, this higher intelligence, this higher consciousness, this being of light, because, you know, our physical life, what we think is a physical life really is a, and Tom Campbell puts it out just so elegantly. He says, this is a consciousness training VR, you know, where young consciousness that are being trained to evolve our quality towards love. And, uh, so, I mean, he's of course from the Renault Institute and, uh, yeah. we've, we've I've, had him on the show a couple of times, a fascinating guy. Um, he's a wonderful guy. So you, have had all you had these experiences now at this point you've had encounters in your life were there any was there anybody that you could talk to about these encounters like you said you got thrown out of church was there at that point was there anybody that you felt comfortable with that you could talk to who was the first person that accepted these things from you um to be honest the the only people that i've ever met that um could relate uh mostly have been people online and in a few cases when I've gone to basically places where metaphysical people tend to gather, um, a few people like a person who studied in India uh, and was uh, a practicing meditator and also a lucid dreamer, um, you know, and he, like me, he's experienced much of what I've talked about. And, uh, but he's the first face-to-face -face person. He's also been able to do things like dream for 10 years. So he could go to sleep and he could dream for 10 years. My record's only two weeks. I talked to Tom Campbell about it and he said that he experienced about three months of stretch time. But I mean, I've had people email me and say they've had an entire lifetime in a single night of sleep. So, you know, there is, there is like such a potency to what we are for experience, right? But very few. And of course, when I went to the Monroe Institute, there were several. Like, I mean, you have Joe McMonigle. I mean, he pretty much is 
been through the gauntlet too. This guy is, is very, very awake and other people that are there are also very, very awake. And the reason why is because they practice being conscious during sleep. So there's the key, you know, what's the key in all of this that can help us access. And that's breaking that immersion, Joe. And I can't stress it. Like when we're here and we're not breaking the immersion, we a hundred percent only know here. But when you start to shift your focus into these altered states of consciousness and start accessing other information, that immersion starts to break. So you can start having maybe 98 and then 2% and then go to 10%, 90%. And I got to the point where I was literally 40%, 60% in terms of non-physical reality and physical reality in my exploration of consciousness. And that broke the immersion, right? And the other thing that also helps come out of that amnesic fog. Like when, when you come into a memory of, for example, we're going to die. You're going to have this conversation with me. You're going to go through these processes and who knows where you're going to end up. Three lifetimes down the road, that lifetime starts to self-edify and suddenly it comes back to this memory. So that lifetime now has to challenge itself and accept it. Was I Joe Rue? You know, did I have that experience? But when you come into a memory here that you've had, you'll know it. I mean, it's a knowing. It's not like, I mean, sure, there's people here. Like when you, when you get into the whole rigmarole of, of people, there's people who want to believe in reincarnation. So they create these great fantasies of being, you know, like. Yeah, the God. I was you know, a. Cleopatra. Yeah, you know, right. exactly. Right. You know, they, they try to create something really, you know, super duper so that people will then, you know, and again, that's an ego trait. That's not. You know, it's it's trying to get people to buy into their story. Well, right. Now, and well, that's now, hold on now. I mean, helpful. I mean, in all fairness, though, if we're reintegrating, as you say, wouldn't we remember? I mean, eventually, the way I see it is, it's kind of a pyramid thing, right? I don't know. I don't know how many beings there are, but is it possible that we could be living out all these experiences if we do indeed go back to one state of consciousness and we are picking up I on those memories? Yeah, and I think it's very possible. I mean, still there's things that I don't know. I'm not claiming at all to say that I know it all. Sure. Because look at, again, we're dealing with something so astronomical when we deal with reality. It is ancient and old. It's bigger than all of us combined. It's a massive system. But what we do know is we're a part of it, right? And that's what we got. So we have a seat in the experience of reality as a part of the self. And for sure, like, you know, going through acquiring knowledge versus belief, you're still, I mean, I still probably have beliefs that I haven't been able to reconcile and shed. So I do believe that it's very likely because the way that I've seen it in the return to the singularity, so to speak, when you kind of move and collapse everything to that single point, that single point of awareness, it suggests that everything does come back to a unified field of consciousness. And I also perceive it as a awareness fractal, hence all the geometry, all this hypnagogia, all of these threads that connect us all. So it's quite possible that we really are one cosmic self that has moved itself into multiplicity to become this manifold of reality. Um, so every little you know, and uh, every little aspect of it is an extension of that universal self or true self. Um, and it is very complex. It's very heady because while we're here as a human, as you know, we have limits. All right. We have sensory limits. We have cognitive limits. There's only so much things we can remember at a certain point in time. Other things get in the way. You know, we have amnesia. So, you know, you can move through your life and, and remember a bunch of things and then forget them all. And then remember them again. Oh, I forgot I had that experience, right? So we have a, a, a memory set that moves into all these different various states of knowing, unknowing. So it's fickle, you know, and that's why it's always a work in progress, I think, while we're here to continue on that path of self-edification towards truth and knowing. But again, that process, you know, it, it really is an individual, you know, where you have to start answering your own questions. Sure. You know, you can't so expect the people around you are going to, always have those answers. So when did you have your next encounter that was pretty profound after that? Well, I can say the only, after the age of 24, when the dualism ended, the only other really profound encounter was when I returned to the lake and found it to be, again, nothing but a sea of light of beings, right? So I do think, you know, the way I see it from there is that we do continue to have an individual personality thread throughout all of these different relationships in it. So, I mean, again, 
that's a bridge that I'm going to have to cross when I shed this skin and no longer have to, you know, face the uncertainty that just being human causes with, you know, because I still get affected by the psychology of immersion for sure and have my own limits. It's just that's part of the system, right? So, you know, stepping out of a piece, piercing the veil, it's it's quite a profound thing to do. So there are other people that say that the soul actually doesn't enter the body until it, you're five or six, even eight years old sometimes. You're telling me in your experience is that that's not true, that you, as soon as you opened your eyes, you were here. Yeah, and that, that was definitely at, you know, a, a level of a baby. I mean, I, I I didn't have any kind of cognitive thoughts like I have now, which has been learned from language and interfacing with, it was like just having a, a clean slate. It's the only way to describe it. But enough of a clean slate and a still mind to then jump back out and return and continue the struggle and the fight. And it was that struggle and the fight which locked in those memories, right? That's why the fragments and some fragments just did not shake. Because I I was having the conflict now while I was integrating into the body, which just made those memories cement so that I couldn't forget them. That, that was just a part of my experience. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, because, all right, so I've got a good book I like to read like once a year. There's a few books I like to read. One's Journeys Out of the Body. The other one is Journeys of Journey of Souls. Did you belong to a set group of family, soul family? Did you meet any familiars, anybody like that? Did you hear people talk about that a lot? Uh, I'm wondering what you have to say on that. Or has it always been a solitary kind of experience for you? No, I mean, I, I do think, um, like I said, when I was a baby or in a, in a child, we had all these different ghost-like beings or spirits or whatever they were. We build relationships here for sure. And we build friendships that they last through lifetimes. And, you know, and when I, other things that I've done on my own, which didn't involve going back into this dualism, like I've gone back and observed the entry station into the human experience. Cause I started coming back out of these lower layers that we get stuck in. And, you know, I've observed people when they're not in a state of shock or not in a state of fear, actually choosing, you know, as an individual or even as groups, um, their next set of lifetimes. So you can come into a group experience uh, for a set of lifetimes with other beings. So it's a very, it's a very compelling system that we have when it comes to having experience here. So, um, but again, you can get into that where you start to have an isolated journey. I mean, I always consider myself a lone wolf. I mean, this lifetime for sure, I would say that it's really just me sitting in the ethers of life and going through a process of self edification, um, by trying to, dig away at all of these deep thoughts and these deep experiences to just have a strong sense and knowing of the bigger picture that, you know, we're all a part of. And these are just some of the epiphanies that I've had. And that's why I can talk about them. Now, have all of your lives been on this earth? No. And you've lived, and did you have any memories of other lives on different planets? Yeah, yeah, of course. But they're hard to process. Um, can I you have try? returned to some of those. It was like literally when I merged with those memories, the way that consciousness was processing information was so accelerated and so beyond how I'm used to processing it here that it just became noise. And it was it was like really hard to grasp at the way it thinks, the way it was, other than I could just identify that that was a part of myself. But And that's just the nature of it. Our consciousness and how it shapes itself and the way we reflect and think it really does change from one avatar to the next avatar in this grander universe. And I think it's designed that way because, I mean, who knows what kind of information I could have, could have brought back that might have affected the system per, per chance, right? I mean, I do think the systems that are here are designed in such a way to keep a specific genre, you know. And, and I, do, I do really believe that, like, you know, it's why we don't have dwarves and elves and those kind of things because the human experience is really about the human experience. And uh, when you get into the larger reality where anything really seems to be possible, um, there's all these different systems in development that have a completely different experience set than what we have here. And as far as I can tell, it seems to like it must just go to infinity. Like I don't want to even dare say it's limited because I just don't know. It just seems so absolutely astronomical when you start looking into the abyss of the universe, it's just that big. <laughs> so when we have a, just this kind of left turn here, but I got to ask you before I forget, 
when we have a false awakening, you know, the dream within a dream within a dream that we mm-hmm. can't get out of, what's really going on there? Yeah, false awakening loops are really fascinating. I've had more than my share of them. But I think, uh, again, I've had false awakenings that I've repeated, you know, like up to about 10 times. And, oh you know, you, you think you wake up and you think you're now in your, and, and this was mostly in my early teenage years when I was getting into all this lucid dreaming, but it didn't scare me. Like apparently it scares a lot of people. It scared the hell out of me. I thought yeah, I was dead uh, or trapped or I thought I was, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, you, you get in a sense, yeah, it's, it's a, a very big psychological mind F. It, it is potent stuff. But for me, um, I just always giggled and laughed every time I came to that realization that I was still in that dream. And I've always been just so comfortable there, right? So I don't tend to ever really have any fears when I'm in that space. So I've had false awakenings where, you know, I'd get ready for school, brush my teeth, even have a shower, and it's all super real, right? As you know, it's a false awakening. So you think you're awake and everything feels physical. And off I go walking and all of a sudden I wake up and I'm in my bed again. And then I repeat the exact same steps thinking, okay, I got to get ready for school. I'm awake now again. Off I go walking down and maybe I'll get a little bit further this time. Boom, I wake up. Oh, okay. Um, all right, I'm going to get ready for school. <laughs> and it's that whole Groundhog Day experience that can happen with the false awakening. And it's, it's potent. I actually I talked to Joe McMonagle and he, he said he was in a false awakening loop that lasted weeks when he was training with Stefan LeBurge and he didn't sound like he liked it. No, no, because look, when I had mine, I thought I was dead the third time that I didn't wake up, I really thought I'm dead. Um, I'm stuck in this loop. And you hear about that sometimes in hauntings and paranormal investigators where people get stuck in these loops. And, uh, yeah, about the third or fourth time, that's what I thought. I thought, my man, I, I died. It wasn't until I saw the hooded figure that I even woke up. And when that thing passed me, the weird thing is, and I've said this many times is that it felt like I was underwater. I could feel it move when it moved away from me. And then I actually did wake up. So it makes me wonder if this thing was holding me down or if it was trying to torture me. But I was, God, I remember I was so scared. I woke up in a sweat. My heart was beating fast. I was just, I thought I was dead. It was horrifying. Yeah, I am, my first out body experience, I thought I was dead. Um, these experiences are powerful. And uh, for example, like it wasn't a false awakening loop um, with me with false awakening loops. Um, I don't know why I, I like them so much. It was, I just, I just, I'm, the, I'm just that kind of person that I just found it fascinating. So maybe you're uh, I morbid. Didn't care. <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, I don't think so. Um, I just think I just, what can you do? You just work through it. I don't bring a lot of fear into it. I, I'm very curious. So, um, and you know, when I first started discovering being conscious during sleep, I literally it lit me up in ways that people don't realize. I mean, I, when I say I love it, I absolutely adore it. I think it's just the most coolest thing that I can do for myself when I close my eyes. But, uh, my first out of body experience was exactly like that though, Joe. I, um, I remember waking up and I felt really weird, like something was off and I could see the moonlight coming through my bedroom. And of course, you know, just as if you were in your dimly lit room with your physical eyes open, everything felt real. Right. So, but there was something amiss. Like I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't put a finger on it. So I decided I'm going to go turn on my light. So off I go to my light switch. And I, I would normally do swing at it with my hand to knock it upward and it didn't turn on. So no light came on. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. So I thought maybe, cause I'm still a little bit of cobwebs in my head. I'm not fully awake. I think I may, maybe just missed the switch. So I go and I do it again, but this time I pay attention and I watch as my hand passes through the light switch. Oh, right. No. And then yeah. I freak out and I then go and I, you know, rapidly try to turn it on, right? And my hands passing through it over and over and over again. And then I look at my bed and I see my body there, right? And frozen fear. And I was like, that's exactly that. I thought I was dead. Because what else do you think? You don't know, right? Suddenly I'm in this different focus state that I'm not used to at that point. And I don't know anything about it. And yeah, the sense of being dead was the very first rational explanation to myself. But then when I got afraid, once the fear started to kick in, I woke up and it was just like being a, in a slingshot. The only way to describe it is just it pulled me in so fast. I didn't even have a chance to blink. Just boom, I'm awake. And I was just like, instead, and all that fear went suddenly, hey, that was really cool. What was that? You know, like, so that sparked my interest and that started my, you know, cause I've had at least, you know, I do the lucid dream, but I also have the out of body experience. I've done a lot of that as well. Um, but they're both part and parcel. I consider them to be 
part of the same package because they both take place in consciousness during sleep and during in that space it's not for me it's not a physical reality right so they're both all in different focus states at that point man so well we're up against the news here but you know i'm so curious about because if you had all these encounters in your young years you must have had some other profound experiences and awakenings that we're not we need to figure out because i we only got like an hour and a half left with you here look guys you can call in if you got a question too um ian would be more than happy to answer it it's 1-800-588-0335 please if you can donate to the website also if you go to the paranormal radio app and you're listening to the show i would ask all of you uh, for ranking sake only just to see where we're at there is an actual lighting the void uh show there you, you don't just have to use the fringe fm you can use the other one too and i will drop that in the chat too so you guys know where it is we'll be right back with ian wilson stay with us In your mind, it's Light in the Void with your host, Joe Roop. Hi, this is David Oman with House at the End of the Drive.com. You're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. This is Paranormal News. I'm Brad Bernards. With this summer's revelation that the U.S. Navy considers UFOs and Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAPs, to be real, a team of venture capitalists, university professors, and military veterans are launching a project to track UFOs off the coast of California. That according to a report in Vice.com. UAP Expeditions is a nonprofit group based in Oregon that will field a top-notch group of uber-experienced professionals providing the public service of field testing new UAP-related technologies. With some of the Silicon Valley UFO hunters, UAP expeditions will pioneer the ability to predict, find, observe, and document UAP for study and analysis. Kevin Day, the group's founder and CEO, recalls tracking the infamous Tic Tac UFOs for several days around Catalina Island off the coast of California. If you can imagine a 47-foot-long Tic Tac, they didn't have any wings, they didn't have any propulsion system. They could travel travel from point A to point B in a matter of a second, even though it was miles and miles and miles away. Now he believes that these objects continue to operate along the same trajectory and migrate from Catalina Island south along the California coast. Get your face in space. A device used in a Samsung publicity campaign to send a selfie of the actress Cara Delevingne into space has crash landed in Michigan. A woman shared a photo of it on the grass in her garden on Facebook. The idea was for people to upload their selfies to a website where they would then be selected at random and returned with a view of the planet behind them. But one expert told BBC News it was unlikely the device was ever intended to get as far as space. This baby fell out of the sky and landed in our yard, and it's still going and flashing. That's courtesy of ABC News. If it's something that's been attached to a high altitude balloon. It's probably gone up around 22 miles, said Hugh Lewis, astrophysics professor at the University of Southampton. The craft, Michigan farmer Nancy Mumby welke photographed in her garden, was a really weird hybrid craft, said Dr. Alice Gorman, an expert on space debris. The giveaway is it's not burned. It would never have reached the surface of the Earth intact from space. Interact with the news at ParabnormalRadio.com. I'm Brad Bernards, Parabnormal News. I like to listen to Lighting the Void because of the guests, the content, and the host, Joe Roop. He's smart, he's intelligent, and he seems to ask the questions that we all have on our mind. We're all searching for the truth, and Joe helps us get closer to it. I love this show. I love this show. I love this show. Lighting the void. What's up, Joe? Hey, man, I just wanted to say your show, dude, keeps getting better and better and better. I love Lighting the Void and the Fringe FM. Hi. 
Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Hey, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man, Joe Root, and his show, Lighting the Void. Hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out-of-compliance checks. That's right. Construction companies doing business with the government can get fined, or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. The davis Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. EMARS offers Compliant Client, a web-based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out-of-compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of EMARS have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact EMARS at emarsinc.com or call 480-595-0466. From the Kingdom of Arkansas, you are listening to Joe Root and Lighting the Void here on the Fringe FM. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or a live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. Phone dial 1 800 888 toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. All right, Ian Wilson is our guest tonight. Youardreaming.org is the website. The call in number is 1 800 588 You can also call the direct numbers 501 424 5130. Uh, Ian Wilson, I want to talk to you about something, okay? I, last week I talked about a dream that I had that concerns me. Now, this is one of those nightmares that you had when you had, uh, when you were a kid, so to speak. One that you always remember. You got a, a few of those, apparently, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, it's it's very strange, and I'll just go over it real quick, just real fast for anybody that hadn't heard it. Basically, it's one of those dreams when you're a kid and your parent tells you to go to sleep. And I lived in a mobile home, right? So the mobile homes have long, dark hallways when the lights are out. And I was afraid of the dark when I was a kid. As soon as I saw the dark, I didn't want to go. Got halfway down the hallway, turned around, started running back towards the living room, and everybody was gone. So there were five people and family members in the living room when my father told me to go to bed. When I got back to the living room, it was so silent. It was scary. And also remember the fact that that scary, dark hallway was behind me still. And as soon as I thought about that, I felt the arm, like something grabbed my shoulder, right? And I didn't even turn around to look when something grabbed my shoulder. I took off running towards the front door because I didn't think anybody was there. And before I got to the front door, there was a vulture 
like a big, nasty-looking vulture standing on a perch. That vulture stuck its head out, pushed its beak down my throat and into my stomach. I felt it in my stomach. My toes curled up. My hands curled up. Every muscle in my body seized, and uh, my eyes rolled in the back of my head. I remember it. It felt like I was being possessed, kind of, almost. Um, kind of like um, Neo in the Matrix when he has that breakthrough. Uh, after that was over, I don't remember unleashing from the bird, but after that was over, I uh, I ran outside. I got picked up by some scary witch. The witch is flying me around on a broom, and I could actually feel being jerked around as if I was on a roller coaster. That's how scary it was. The witch drops me off, and it's midnight. It's night time. Out in the front yard, my dad's chopping wood for some reason, and I'll run to him, and he puts his hand up, kind of like stop you know, just a straight hand, stop, go in the house and go to sleep. Now, I always kind of thought that that was, um, maybe I was traumatized because my father didn't give me enough attention. Hell, I don't know. But I got this email that concerns me. It said, it says, good morning. I'm Luke, a big fan of the show. And while listening to your dream work and nightmares episode during the segment, uh, when the host, that's me, is talking with the guest Zelda, who was on there with us that night about his childhood dream. I had an unpleasant flash epiphany about what might have happened. I pulled over on the freeway on my way to work writing this because it was such a strong feeling. My apologies because it's about to get dark and personal. Well, you know me. I'll get personal on this show real fast because I don't think we can get to the show, uh, truth without it. Um, this might be upsetting and you might be angry at me if I'm right or wrong or even totally off. So please prepare yourself. In short, I think you may have been sexually abused that night. The trailer, the home represents your body. You exited your body when somebody forcibly did what they wanted to do to you. The vulture is a carrion bird and is used in funerary rites in which dead bodies are chopped up and placed out for the birds to consume them, taking the deceased back to heaven or the sky. When you left the trailer, your father was chopping wood, which is symbolic of your body again, and you were being chopped up and fed to the birds, metaphorically speaking, and the symbol of the witch from the Wizard of Oz is a classic symbol of childhood disassociation. And then he says, CMK Ultra. Flying into the sky mixed with vulture symbolism is you astral traveling away from your body, which is being abused or chopped to pieces. Now, witches use wood brooms to fly and achieve astral flight. Uh, your dad, again, was chopping wood. Remember Jack, the father from The Shining with the axe. Here's Johnny, so to speak. Uh, Danny wasn't abused by a ghost, but the witch Jack meets in room 237 is the shadow of his own sexual abuse. This is symbolized by the rotting corpse of the witch. That's Jack's shadow, and it harms his family. I'm really sorry if I'm wrong, but I couldn't get this off my mind. And now I'm late for work back on the freeway. God bless you guys. Uh, <laughs> you have an incredible show and become number one inspiration for my own amateur podcast where we decode symbolism in movies. Go figure. Much love, Luke. Well, thanks for your email, Luke, and your concern. Um, I'd like to think that the people there that day would have not done that to me. I know my father didn't. Um, and the people there, they just, they're not those kind of people. But when you're a kid, you never know. I don't think that's what happened, honestly. I'm not just saying that because I didn't want it to happen to me. I just think it was something else. But since we've got a dream explorer here of 30-something years experience, what do you think it was, Ian? Well, I can honestly relate with childhood nightmares. Um, prior to becoming a lucid dreamer, where now I don't have those types of experiences, um, I went through my share of what I call Jungian archetypes, for example, like we've all seen the movie. Well, maybe we haven't all seen it, the, the grudge where, uh, you know, the, she starts pulling hair out of her mouth. Well, that's a very common Jungian archetype. I've gone through that where, and it can be like the dream state, it can appear and feel as visceral and real as our waking life, which means you can feel pain. You can, I do. I mean, I remember pulling hair out of my mouth and the strands were as if they were attached or had grown from my throat and I could feel the strands pulling from hair follicles inside my throat. So very, a very creepy and ugly dream. Um, I've had a lot of different things uh, in the dream state prior to when I started to clean that noise up by becoming conscious and then starting to learn to program my dreams that fit all within these Jungian archetypes. So, you know, something like um, a bird coming into your body. Well, I mean, I've had things like tentacles. I mean, it, there's, it's crazy when you start to remember the kind of nightmares that we have as children, which I think is why a lot of us shut down the dream state and our participation in it because untrained, that wildness of our subconscious mind can be a real nasty beast. Um, and as we know, 
uh, Carl Jung was quite brilliant in coming up with a lot of these archetypes, like your teeth falling out. Well, you'd be amazed how many people have dreams about their teeth falling out. It's not oh, a yeah. subjective experience, right? So in the dream state, there's common experiences, but I think this is also may tie into the fact that we are all interconnected. So we're sharing potentially experiences amongst each other and certain uh, patterns emerge from one being and radiates through the system and others pick it up and then they start to have that experience as well, right? So there's that interconnectedness that can draw into these types of things. Um, but I mean, like I, when I was a kid, I was haunted by, you know, we talk about shadow people and goblins, man. I had like um, false awakenings where I would see a skull with freaking bat wings flying right at my face, right? And how scary is that for a kid? Now, if that would happen to me now, it would not be at all wouldn't phase me. I wouldn't even have an issue with it. And I would probably just use dream control and make it disappear. I mean, I have that much control, so it's not a big deal. Right. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I was, I was hunted by this, uh, this being that was before I even watched the movie Beetlejuice, it was, uh, it, would, it could grow long arms and had razor blades for fingertips. And this is like even before Friday the thir- 13th and this thing would attack me and cut me and it would hurt. Right. And it was constantly assaulting me in certain dreams. But as I got more proficient with dreaming at one point, it, I had a re-encounter with this thing. And again, it's just an aspect of myself. It's just, it, and that's how I reconciled it. Is so that well, I, before we get into your story, you're saying mine was probably just archetypes, right? Jungian, yeah, okay. exactly. All right. That's, that's what I think it is. It has a total archetype vibe to it because I've had similar, not necessarily the vulture, but I've had spiders crawling into my mouth. I mean, you get, you get lots of really creepy things when, you know, um, it, it literally like our dreams are good for nightmares. We know we have nightmares, right? And there's that big part of nightmares in dreaming until we start to get a sense of control over that wildness, right? So yeah, but the same thing with this being like, I mean, it was assaulting me constantly in the dream state. And then finally one time, it cornered me in a closet and I remember being terrified because it, because it has had this fear over me. And then my solution was, you know, screw you, buddy. I'm you. And I, I dove into it and became it. And it oh, literally, you, you pulled know, a that, Neo. Yeah, that's cool. I did. I pulled a Neo. And this is like, I mean, I must've been maybe seven or eight years old. Like that was, that was kind of like that reconciliation of that. And then it stopped. Right. And it's the same thing with reoccurring dreams. Like, because we do have traumas. Life is very traumatic. And if we have these past lives, as you can imagine, I mean, I lived through the trauma of dying over and over and over again. I mean, it was awful for five years. For five years, a good portion of my dreaming was the dying process. And I, we can get back to the dripping of the water was actually blood dripping from my ear, right? So by the time I perceived it as water because I didn't know what happened. But when I returned to those memories now with a better clarity, it was because I was shot in the head and it was the blood trickling down by my ear. Um, but at the time, I could only sense it or thought it was water. So it's interesting when you can clean up and have a better perception of certain experiences that you have. All right. So, okay, here's the weird part about this thing. I, and where I think that the guy in the email might be right. I just look, my dad was there. My dad's not that way. Never has been. Sorry. I mean, I know my father better than anybody. Uh, he would kill somebody if they did that. And he would also wouldn't allow anybody to be back there while I'm back there. It just didn't happen that way. But the weird thing is, and maybe I'm in denial, who knows, or maybe I am MK altered, who knows? Uh, But the weird thing is, is I don't remember if it was a dream. That's the thing. When he told me to go to bed, I don't remember it being a dream. I don't remember waking up. None of that. I just remember the sequence. Yeah, but that, that for sure, you know, was a dream. And, and again, the thing too with the how potent dreams can be for their, their realism, right? Uh, and especially being a kid and not being that aware of those experiences, it'd be very easy to confuse. I mean, I meet people that confuse dreams that they have with reality. It's a common symptom for people that aren't very um, experienced with it. Um, I've been accused of doing things from girlfriends because they dreamt about it. You know, right. I've had oh, that yeah. experience. So, you know, it does happen. Uh, people get dream leak, I guess. Uh, myself, um, I don't think, I don't think I've pulled anything where I couldn't discern between dream and reality up until when I started having precognition. That's when it was like, okay, now there's something really weird happening here where I'm seeing the future in dreams. That That's a trip, right? I mean, because now you're experiencing the future and you're experiencing first as a dream and now it's rendering out in front of you when that dream actualizes and you're like, what the hell's going on here? And that was, again, 
you know, so there, there, there's this really bizarre, deeper part of us that, yeah, and this is what we're all here to talk about and discover. I mean, you know, I, that's why I really try to steer away from beliefs because we want to get to the truth and, and to get to the truth is by honest, genuine experience shared amongst each other. Like, I think we will get there by just being honest about these things, talking about them, keeping them from being in the shadows and the taboo. No. And, yeah. And again, I appreciate who, you know, Luke for sending that. I'm not afraid to, to talk about personal stuff like that. I just don't think we can get to the truth or even remotely uh, figure out what's in the void without being a little bit vulnerable on air sometimes. So, um, for sure. But, um, okay, so you had all these encounters when you were younger. Mm -hmm. What any what was the next profound experience, the next learning experience for you that taught you something as big as what the light beings taught you? Well, we did cover that in the other show, and that's when I started to modify dreams before they came true and started seeing those. And that happened actually after I went through the unification or the dualism ended, and that's when I started now venturing on my own to start to answer those bigger questions and started to explore the possibility of changing reality by changing precognitive dream content before it actualized and started seeing those results. So, But by that point, the dualism had ended, so... At the age of 24, that was the last big encounter and big epiphany um, up until then when I returned to the lake. And that was when I was 40, 45, so two years ago. So wow. from the age of 24 onward, um, that dualism just hasn't been there. I haven't gone back and re-encountered the being of light ever since I realized it was myself. Now, does this sound familiar when you, uh, in the book of Thoth, uh, the writer or channeler of that book, or I wouldn't say the book of Thoth. Let's just say the Emerald Tablets of Thoth is what it is because Crowley wrote the book of Thoth. And in that uh, writing, in that text, he talks about a garden or so to speak, like you talk about kind of like the lake, but a sea of souls where he could see these kind of light beings as they were changing color and stuff and learning and advancing almost. He talked about it from an agriculture point of view, though as if he could see all of the beings. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, like I said, my encounter with that potential lake, it only has happened twice for me that I am consciously aware of here, um, as to in the unconscious part of myself, probably more. But um, So I didn't get to see any kind of changes in hues or tones or the growth process towards the being of light. I went from the dimly gray lit cells to the end, end game with nothing in between to see or observe. And that doesn't mean I may not come back to that or see that, but maybe he did. I mean, that's the thing with these types of experiences. Um, when we start finding things that are, you know, should be subjective, but we're seeing other people are having the same similar types of experiences. And I mean, I've never read that book and I really don't know much about that. Experience. Yeah. It's, but, a, you know, it's a channel text that, as all yeah, it is. But it that makes a lot of sense. Um, links. To okay. Well, Hmm. Do you feel like there's this other book I was wanting to talk about on another show, but I feel like I'll bring it up here. And uh, it has to do with astrology. And it's an old, I mean, if you're an astrologer, like a professional one, I'm sure you've read it. It's called the inner sky by uh, Stephen Forrester and a couple other books I read that talk about the cycles of life as if uh, we go through each sign or archetype of each sign. So there's 12 signs in the Zodiac, you know, all this stuff, right? Uh, but there's, mm -hmm. Uh, cycles that we go through and some people are more advanced just for example like if you're an Aries sun sign doesn't matter what your moon sign is but if you're an Aries sun sign doesn't always mean like this is your first rodeo you could be in the last cycle does, does that sound right do you feel like there's cycles that we go through based on your experience with these I do believe that there's an evolutionary process in this system that is evolving us for sure I mean you can't be here in reality in this deep of an immersive experience and not gain from that experience. And that knowledge and experience that you're gaining is going to change you. You are going to grow from it. Um, like, you know, it's interesting because I see it in other people. Like, I mean, you know, if you, a good example, like, I mean, I, I, I really like seeing where Mike Tyson's at today versus where he was when he was in his younger years as the, you know, world's heavyweight champion. And 
now he, he, you can tell that he's grown into a much more enlightened person. You know, he's much more compassionate and empathetic. And uh, another good example um, would be like Steve-O. I mean, you look at him today versus where he was when he was on Jackass. You can see that he's evolved. He's grown as a being, right? So, you know, we, we are evolving our quality here. Um, and we go through a lot of shit to get to that. You know, mm-hmm. we really, I'm sorry, the use of that word, but we, we really do. Like, we're really in the deep of it. And like I said, one thing that I like to use as a metaphor is we're all diamonds in the rough. And coal doesn't become a diamond without pressure. So we're under this pressure. And this pressure is there to evolve us. And it's not going to be easy. I mean, we're going to suffer. We're going to break a toe. We're going to hurt a person's feelings. We're going to potentially some people are going to do some very terrible things. But, you know, the more you evolve that quality, the less load you're going to put on the system, the less harmful you'll be to other people and the more compassionate, the more kind, the more loving. And, and that's part of the evolutionary process is, is evolving us towards being, you know, uh, a highly evolved part of the self, you know, like something that's going to be quite beautiful and quite wonderful. And it's going to be like, you know, when we come out of the fog of our experience and start accessing our knowing, it'll all just click and make sense. And we, I'm pretty confident that we're going to come to points, not necessarily today and potentially not even in this lifetime where we'll come into that higher consciousness and have a much broader perspective of what we are. Um, do but you I do know this. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, what I do know is we didn't start here on earth. Like I said, I, when I came to earth, it was already here. I picked a experience to have, which was a person. And we kind of talked about that over the uh, break where how do we know that, you know, 20, 30, 80 different um, beings could come and experience one person's lifetime here to see what that was like. I mean, that's quite a big possibility and I can't necessarily rule that out. Like, you know, me as Ian Wilson may just be, you know, I could be like the 17th entity to come through and experience Ian. Like, I, I mean, you know, it's already here. It was already here. I've just come into it now, right? That's gotcha. part of my journey. So there's a lot of mystery in our universe, a lot of things to unravel. And more questions coming in here. This is from Mojo in the chat room. And for some reason, I always miss Mojo's question. So we're going to break this little formula between Mojo and I here right now. Uh, it says, what's up, Joe? Can you ask him about the death process in regards to going through the tunnel and the life review aspect? Because belief or slash religion, we make it different for everybody, uh, as well as, is there such a thing as the Lords of Karma or Archons? So but he, I think he basically is asking you about the life review, the tunnel, um, and Karma or Archons, which is something we talked about on here with a, a couple of people. Did you have any experiences with that? Yeah, to a, to, I'll have to sit here and kind of look at, because I have covered that in myself in looking at the, what information I did get when I started connecting to not just the second, you know, the second life I had, but the threads that were there. And it does appear that in certain, for sure, our belief systems in non-physical reality, just like a dream, we, we're here sitting in front of a recursive feedback interface that's reality. So uh, in, a, in the dream state, our experiences, our beliefs relative to us shape the content of that. And it's the same when we die. It's still that recursive thought reactive feedback interface. And so when we go into that state, um, better believe that it's going to organize itself to accommodate you based on your personality, your belief systems, et cetera, et cetera, to make it somewhat appropriate when you go there because you're going to be painting it with all those beliefs, painting it with all those, like, all those expectations. And, uh, but what I've observed is we definitely do go through and in encounters that I can see in other lifetimes, what that being at least was looking in me was how I was treating other people. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about what I didn't like, but it was how I was with other beings, how were those relationships, you know, it was checking the quality of, of the interactions the social interactions, uh, were a big part of it. Like, you know, how were you with other people? You know, why would you do this? Why it's, 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 it, it is kind of like a, because that being is obviously me, that being is obviously you. It's effectively, I think it's all of us as that 
unified oneness, um, just kind of working with parts of itself. You know, you're not getting the hypothermia the- on me, are you? Falling asleep out there? No, no. no. Just My so you guys audience- know, Ian's out there. And I don't know what part of Canada I keep forgetting, but it's one degrees. You said where you're at, right? Yeah. So it's up north. You're in the woods. He's not in his house, folks. He's outside in the woods right now. I'm sitting uh, in my car, so it's too bad. Oh man, you just yeah. took the nostalgia away. I was trying to tell everybody right. you, you. I had. I wanted people to imagine you sitting on a stump or something. Um, <laughs> well, I could. <laughs> I just need to open the door. I hope you got the heat cold. on. Yeah. No, no, it's off right now, but it's fine. But yeah, so the the thing too is like we do go through kind of uh, a self review for sure. But I, I do believe that you know when we come into meeting that dualistic other or that being of light, it really is our ourself. It's not a externalized entity. It's we're that interconnected in this system. We're a part of that system, and and it's given me enough metaphors and examples of that interconnectedness that for me it's really hard to escape the idea that we didn't come from a oneness in this whole journey that we're on that we're not all just aspects of each other Uh, and that's why i really cringe at violence and i really cringe at abuse and i really cringe at all the the nasty that's here and how people treat other people because you know like i i say you know what we do to others here we're doing to ourselves and uh and i think that's kind of when you start reaching that higher awareness of the relationships that we have with each other and that's why love is so important Uh, and it's sad that it's so lacking right now in this current era you i look at the world and i i do see love don't get me wrong i'm not saying it's not there but there's a big lack of it as well well when we have a lot of growing up to do (laughs) there is there is a quote uh in in the biblical text that says you know whatever judgment you pass or whatever you do it's going to be done to you, and everybody thinks it's a big metaphor. Well, what you're telling me is, is no, uh, you're going to experience that stuff, all of it, whatever you do to people. Yeah, there's there's that interconnectedness, and I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in between segues from lifetimes to lifetimes. I've seen how it has played a role, um, like I say, going from the victimizer to the victim role in our sojourns here and but it's part of the learning process because you know um this system really is trying to evolve us to this higher quality and like i said i mean our journey here didn't start at this lifetime it really is threaded as far as i can see into a much bigger spectrum of infinity like we shouldn't really adhere to our linear human perspectives when dealing with the bigger picture And coming back to an idea of absolute or infinite is probably much more appropriate when dealing with the nature of ourself and reality. You know, that we're just kind of, because I remember when I came here, my motive for coming in and having this immersive experience is because I was bored. Uh, I got that much information from it and I was not at all like I am right now. So how I perceived myself was more like a geometrical fractal, a uh, low resolution being, <laughs> you know, so it's like going from like, uh, you know, 8-bit graphics to suddenly becoming, you know, super high-end CGI, right? And I do remember that it was one of the big things about when I, you know, died, died in that first lifetime and came back, I was still resonant of my, my, my origin self. And I just thought it was amazing, even though you know, I can look at that life now and that entry life would be like, well, you know, I wasn't necessarily a very good person. I, I don't want to get into too much of the details, but let's just say I, you know, did some nasty stuff in that lifetime that was, I would consider to be very bad and I wouldn't want to do in to anyone, but I did it in that one. But coming out of it as an experience, I just thought it was the most amazing thing ever. And, uh, of course drew me in for the next one. And then after a certain sequence of the next ones, I completely forgot about my origin self. It was done. Uh, all I knew was coming here and being human so that's the layering that effect that affects us until we completely forget gotcha well look we, so, we're heading into the the last uh, hour of the show here this stuff goes by really quick um but you, we'll get to the rest of your questions in the chat room and also if you want to call in you can do that as well the direct number works best 501-424-5130 i'm joe Roop. this is lighting the void we'll be right back
Joseph Roop is your host. Pull back the blinds and uncover the truth. This is Lighting the Void Radio. You're listening to The Fringe FM. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal, there's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on The Fringe FM. Hey, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man, Joe Root, and his show, Lighting the Void. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact the Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Listen, I want to tell you about G.I. Joy from GetTheTea.com. It's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system I can recommend, and that's all based on my experience. Packed with colostrum, acidophilus, aloe, peppermint, and turmeric. If you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is, I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. Hi, this is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Root on the Fringe FM. Listen, I want to tell you about G.I. Joy from GetTheTea.com. It's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system I can recommend, and that's all based on my experience. Packed with colostrum, acidophilus, aloe, peppermint, and turmeric. If you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is, I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. Right, me old Chinas. I know it's an ad break, but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of Rosie Lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your Gregory Peck, you need to listen to me bubble. If, like me, you found your way to light in the void via a downloadable podcast, you might want to take a butcher's at the Fringe FM Wind and Kite. You won't Adam and Eve how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon and J.D. Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and theories of the author of The Fish You Just Finished Reading. Or you could pick up the dog and bone, call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour. Before you put on the ansel or crack open a bottle of vino or roller joint, Go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. Hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out-of-compliance checks. That's right. Construction companies doing business with the government can get fined, or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. 
The Davis Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. EMARS offers Compliant Client, a web-based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out-of-compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of EMARS have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact EMARS at emarsinc.com or call 480-595-0466. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. All right, so I want to ask you guys to do a favor, and uh, a caller is here with us. Came up with a good idea, actually, the Night Stalker. There is a speak pipe button on lightingthevoid.com. If you go to contact, you can use your phone. Just go to the contact page, hit that speak pipe button. Uh, And this is kind of how we make promos for the show too. But from here on out, I want everybody, if you will, just take a little bit of time because I'm making something really cool. And I want you to say your name and then that you're a void walker. That's all I want you to say. And when I get done with this thing, you're going to like it. And uh, tonight our guest is definitely a void walker in my opinion ian wilson the website is you are dreaming.org right isn't that the website i hope i'm not saying that wrong you are dreaming.org well, right. and um the whole idea is what i want to get into next is how life is but a dream just like the song you know row 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 your boat gently down the stream okay we probably are in a dream and uh ian believes that and we're going to talk about that in just a second but the night stalker is called in the night stalker strikes again. What's on your mind, brother? <laughs> What's going on? Hey, hey, uh, really great show so far. Really, really uh, fascinating. Thank you. Uh, stories. You got a question for Ian? I do. I do. Um, at the beginning of the show, you were talking about how um, we like used to be light bodies and how we kind of incarnate into these, or we kind of choose to experience these different lifetimes. So like a lot of time in like the kind of fringe and conspiracy and like new agey communi- uh, communities, they get, a real anti-technology, but I kind of always like at least um, throw the idea out there: is it possible to incarnate into a machine? Like uh, we're talking about Duncan Trussell in the chat earlier. Mm. He has a quote from a Buddhist Lama about how uh, I don't know if he asked him or if somebody he knows asked the Buddhist Lama if um, incarnating into a person is possible, and they responded, "When when the vessel is sophisticated enough, then the soul can incarnate into it." So. Do you believe that that is possible in the future of humanity, or is that um, does that go against the system we're in? Well, I, through personal experience, for what I know, don't have that experience that I can relate to. But that doesn't mean it's not possible because when I've done out of body things, I have had the experience where my consciousness has shifted form into things like when you pass into a tree and you become the tree. Or, for example, passing through a wall, you can start to feel, and it's really hard to describe, the wood, the, you know, I've become water, I've become a cloud. So I think consciousness as a feedback interface is in everything. So even a machine, potentially, um, you could merge into that and have an experience of it from that perspective. But to get into that, it's a... It's a weird thing because I don't think I've interfaced with, but funny that you say that because I did have a friend tell me a dream where he dreamt that he was a wood screw of all things. What and he hell? told me, I, he, this is a funny story. So this is not my experience. 
And he said, yeah, it was the weirdest thing because I was so happy because I knew I was going to be used for an important project. And I just felt all this joy and love of what, what my use was going to be and my purpose as a wood screw. And I was like, that's wow. just kind of a really, really trippy dream. But then, you know, I look <laughs> at some of the things that I've experienced when I've kind of stepped out of my Ian ego and just let myself pour into experience where, you know, becoming water was really kind of cool and becoming, you know, and, and, and like, I mean, I don't have just human memories. I mean, there's quite a few that I've come across, like being a water spider. And I had to look it up and find out that there actually really are water spiders here. But I had a dream that I was a water spider uh, or a memory. I wouldn't even call it a dream that I was a water spider. And it was really like a very bizarre experience. But I, and then I've had other experiences that are definitely insect animal um, <clears throat> along the way. But I think we all do. I think we all have that nested in us. I, I don't think when we're here having experiences right now, we have a very human centric ego as humans. You know, everyone puts this big emphasis that we're so damn special and everything else around us is lesser mm -hmm. than. But I, I don't necessarily share that mm -hmm. perspective. I think everything offers experience. And if you're willing, you can learn from that experience. And it's not that negative. Like I don't look at any of those types of experiences with any sense of negativity. But again, when we're dealing with this reality system and how astronomical it is, um, I don't put anything against the possibilities of what you can interface with, you know, as your consciousness and your awareness yeah. once you start to come out of the immersiveness of your, your current identity. But uh, again, you know, that's not a, something that I know, but uh, I won't rule out the possibility, but again, I don't know. So, yeah. huh. Great answer. That's really cool. Uh, one more quick question for you. Um, you mentioned how, uh, your incarnations aren't uh, prohibited by time, like they're nonlinear. That That's mean, right. That's my observation. Incarnate, could you incarnate into something that, from our perspective, is happening in the future? Like, could you predict future events by catching glimpses of future lives? I do believe so. I mean, I know that um, when we look at all that information that's there, I mean, I've experienced precognitive events in this lifetime relative to this lifetime and numerously in, in mm -hmm. my life, which tells me that the future in the system is already there. And I was talking to Joe about this. I was saying that like when I came to the system before I jumped in and got mind wiped and took on a lifetime, uh, the first life I had was, I, I'm pretty confident was in the seventies era because it all fits that. Right. And then I went mm -hmm. and moved on from there even towards like, I mean, we haven't talked about a lot of them. I mean, I have a civil war life memory as well. One being as well, um, in the 19 or 1800s, cause I got shot in the back when I walked into a saloon and, uh, dropped dead there. And, uh, so, you know, these, these threads of memory show me that, yeah, I mean, think of earth as a database of experience and we are parsing those experiences that we're coming into those experiences for a very intimate and personal relationship with an era, a time, a genre as an individual in that story, that earth story that we're a part of. So it's all very much like a narrative that's here. And it's all driven for experience. Like our whole journey here is 100% about an experience. There you go. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Great show. Are you stocking okay, the shelves starting you. tonight? You working? No, I got a, uh... I have Mondays off, so I'm uh, sitting outside enjoying the show. Fantastic. Thank you for calling in, brother. I appreciate it. Later, guys. Great show. Thank you. Bye. Well, sure. you know, it's interesting that you're talking about a wood screw and stuff because we've, uh, have you ever, you know what the idea of animism is? Have you heard of that before, Ian? I don't believe I have, so educate me. Well, I'm not so sure I understand it either, but there's, uh, this idea that everything is in a state of becoming and everything has spirit and consciousness in it from rocks to trees to screws to everything. And so a lot of times these magicians, even when they go to a city, the the city itself, because it's had energy put into it, has some type of spirit. Um, so everything is alive, so to speak. And so these magicians, witches, wizards, whatever you want to call it, they believe, you know, that, hey, if I go outside and I cut the grass, I'm liable to piss off some type of grass spirit or something, you know. Uh, you have any thoughts on that based on what you've learned about consciousness? Well, I think it's to a degree tolerant. 
um, because you have to imagine that this earth again has been around for a very long time and things have been, we, we live a part, as part of a food chain. So obviously the system knows that you have to eat and to eat, you have to kill, right? I mean, we've come from that. I mean, we see it in nature. Um, but I think when it's done in a way where it's not disrespectful to, you know, when it doesn't come out of malice and just pure hate, I think that's the thing that the system doesn't like. It's like, uh, you don't have to be that way, but you know, we, we are surviving, we're an animal and we have survival based instincts and a big part of our life is surviving. And to survive, you do have to do things where you will compromise your ethics. Like, I mean, if the system goes and crashes and people are suddenly now left where they don't have what we have today in terms of the abundant food and all that kind of stuff, well, we're going to be forced to do some pretty terrible things to get food. So back to the forests, back to doing things, right? Um, but that's, that's the nature of earth is it is based on a food chain. So we are going to do things that are going to hurt other life forms because, you know, that's just the whole cycle of it here. I mean, fish are going to eat smaller little shrimps and things like that. It's just the way it's always been. So I don't think that carries a lot of weight because that's just the natural way of things. But I think where the weight comes in is when it comes from like a really dark malice or a hate, like when you're, you know, so cutting your grass isn't going to offend a grass spirit unless you're like really, you know, doing it for cruelty or happy that you're hurting something or having a malice in your intentions. Hmm. If that makes sense. So you recall, this is what I want to ask you about before we get into that, we're living in a dream mm -hmm. during the break. You and I talked about something, the same thing that Robert Bruce talks about in his out of body stuff is that it's not the fact that we don't have a dream or we don't go out of body. We do every single night. The problem is, is that we don't recall it. We don't remember That's it. Right. Um, what are some of the tricks that you do to recall things, to recall? Yeah. Your dream? And that's, that's a, I mean, I've been actually just recently, I got a whole new video set up. So with a green screen, so I can start recording, uh, vlogs of my dreams and just drop the processes. And I, so I talk about that right in those videos about dream recall. And, uh, so one thing about amnesia is that it needs a trigger to bring back memory, right? So for dreaming, and this has worked well for me, um, I still at this age, I can wake up and not remember a dream. But if I get out of bed and don't try to remember it, I won't. It's done. It's gone. But if I lay there and start to think about any fragment, because all it takes is a fragment. Once you grab that little fragment, it seems to pull everything forward, right, from that amnesic fog. So the process of memory is, is chasing fragments until they become, you know, a full memory. And that's the same thing with like past life memory. You will chase a fragment. See, I think we have to, one of the things I tell myself is like, heal the fragmented mind is kind of something that I think about is like, yeah, we have all these fragmented memories and we've got to kind of need to pull them all together, right? Get them organized, get them out of being fragments. So, but it does work that way. It starts off as a fragment and then from that fragment, we get a thread and from that thread, we get a full series of information from it, right? And it's the same with dreaming. So when you wake up and you don't remember anything, just start to say, well, I know I dreamt. Let me think, let me think. Okay, what do I remember? And all of a sudden you get a faint little image of, you know, maybe being at a house. And then, oh yeah, okay, I was at that house. What else was there in that house? And then you'll start coming back into that memory. Um, but it's just a process of recall, working with, with recalling information. And again, best to do before you get out of bed and go about your day um, in that regard. And it's the same thing if you start coming into these fragmented memories of yourself, if you do start to oh, faintly remember your civil war kind of experience and next thing you know, a little bit more pieces of that puzzle start to drop and you go, Oh yeah, I remember that. And I remember that it's an interesting thing about memory because once you do encounter it, you come back to that knowing and you'll know it's from yourself. Right? So that's a, a very interesting process to go through. Fascinating. All right. So Y'all yeah, write that down because uh, everybody should be having a dream journal right now. So how do you, what was your first clue that the life that we live in now is in fact a very deep dream, a very deep dream state? I knew that when I was two. So at the age of two, I was already having that. I mean, I remember my dad took us out and we were on a boat he was fishing with his friends and I was pretty young. So they, they kind of had us in the boat. And I remember looking at the trees and the mountains and I was like, I'm back in the dream. I'm back in the dream. So I was thinking that way, like I have returned here back to the dream. And 
you know, I remember walking and looking at blades of grass, you know, like we like more like almost like a long wheat um, near a farm. And I was looking at it and because I had seen it before, even though I was encountering it there and I was looking at it going, here I am again, back in the dream, looking at the dream. So, so as a young, young, young person, I was already kind of looking at reality from this idea that it was a dream. But the, the big epiphanies didn't come until I started to have precognitive relationships with dreams. And that's what solidified the knowing where you get to that bridge that you can't uncross. And for me, that was the lucid precognitive dreams, not the unconscious or non-lucid precognitive dreams. Once I was lucid and self-aware with all of my cognitive and analytical abilities, all my full memory, my full awareness. And then I can, I, mean, I can't tell you what it's like, Joe, unless you experience it yourself sitting in a dream as visceral and real as they can be and you're seeing all the details and you're really aware of it and you're very conscious of it and then all of a sudden that plays out in front of you in your waking life Hmm. it it is the most profound thing because for me when that's happened for me it's like okay you're not seeing reality anymore you're not seeing those belief systems you are seeing that dream that dream is now right in front of you and you can't escape it you can't run from it right you're like this is that lucid dream you know and it's now the waking world. And I've had way too many of those in my lifetime, which again, led to the altering or changing of dream content to get that final validation that I needed to answer that question. And that's now, are you talking that. about precog like you saw, like Jung talks about, you saw certain symbols that represented your reality or that you saw reality in both realms? Yeah, it's like a, it's, it's really deep because it's, you know how when you watch a TV show, you pick up on all the, the things that are going on. So when you see that the next time it's a rerun, right? And you already know, oh, I already know what the character's doing. I already know this. I already know that because I've seen, it, I've seen it, right? So when you have a literal precognitive dream, right? So when you're in the dream, it will feel and appear as real as your waking life, but you'll, you'll know it's a dream or whatever. It'll play out 100% if it's literal, exactly, even the way you're thinking, even the way you're feeling, all from your first person narrative. And then the next thing will happen is when that does come true, it is quite, in fact, that dream event now becoming a future event. But it did start as a dream in the original part of it. And I look at that now as part of a creative process, you know, that somehow we're working with a co-creative process with reality at an unconscious state. And all I did was in certain moments of my life became conscious of that creative process. Man, just to think, like, if we all could tap into this, you know, you you hear about how life sucks because you got your corporate job, and I really wish I could do this for a living, and I really want to travel and go to these places and do this. If we all could really tap into this, which I believe we can, we could change our lives 100%. 100%. We could flip things around as fast as we wanted to. But here's the problem that I have with that, Ian, based on what you're telling me, the encounters, the light beings, is that we still have to play out these karmas. Is there any way to get rid of it? The only way to get rid of it is to learn, I guess, is to transcend that understanding. I I do believe that, you know, we, we, we do have to start progressing more cooperative together as, as a global community. Like we have to start getting away from this racial kind of, you know, that person's black, that person's white, that person's female, you know, when you start seeing it in the spectrum of lifetimes, well, you've probably been a female, you've probably been other races. Um, You know, we have to go past the hate for sure, collectively. And we have to start, I do believe that we're here to be the stewards of this world. Like we're here to care for this planet. We're not here to destroy it. That's just kind of come about from all the darkness that's been here, all the wars that we've been through. There's a lot of abuse and patterns of abuse that we have to, as a group, end and stop you know but uh it's tough when the media doesn't do anything but create diverse of issues trying to perpetuate yeah, ideas everybody. of hate yeah exactly so it's kind of like that tower of babel you know how in the bible they talk about the tower of babel and that we all got split up with these different languages so that we couldn't cooperate right and it seems that that's a very big challenge for us to come back from not cooperating as a group as you know and and to get there it really is an issue of love like it it really is when you you know like for me when i see other people i see that relationship that i'm a part of them and they're a part of me just like the tree 
I'm a part of that tree. The tree's a part of me. We're all interconnected. And I, and I have a sense of that. So I don't want to judge that other person. I don't, I have empathy and I do put myself in other people's shoes to understand their plight and their sojourn, um, in the experience. So, but that's me, right? I'm different in my own development. So I'm a very empathetic person and I value compassion. I value all these loving things because, you know, at the end of the day, I do care. I mean, I'm not afraid to admit it. I care about you. I care about our listeners. I care about us as a group, as a planet. And I do want to see us succeed. But we have to come back to love. That's that lack of love part I mentioned, those four things that are what we're working on. That's deep stuff, man. You, uh, you're not afraid of death, are you? There's not few, at all. There's few people I talk on here that will that I, that have told me that they're not, that I really believe. I really believe that you're one of them, that you're not, not at all. No, I've been through it enough times to know, but it doesn't mean I'm in rushing it because while you're here in this lifetime, one of the things that I didn't like about my last lifetime, and it, it really, like I said, some of the things I learned from that is that you really do need to be with the people that you're with in this current lifetime and develop those friendships and those relationships. So, you know, I didn't get a chance to be a father. I didn't get a chance to have a wife. I didn't get a chance to enjoy those qualities. <clears throat> but in this lifetime, at least I now have a daughter and I have just really a, a wonderful relationship with her. And I really do appreciate the relationships I have with people. So, you know, when I'm with somebody having that coffee, I really do listen and I really do appreciate that time. So, you know, that's just how it's kind of changed me in this lifetime. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I really appreciate that. Look, uh, guys, we're running out of time here. Uh, if you got any questions... The call in number is 1-800-588-0335. Again, go to the contact page at Lighting the Void. Hit that speak pipe button. Tell us that your name, where you're from, that you're a void walker. Or, you know, you can always tell us a recommendation or why you listen to the show, etc. And we'll, I'll divvy it up and put it on the air. We'll be right back. Youardreaming.org is the website. Ian Wilson is our guest tonight. Stay with us. Clyde Lewis. You are listening to The Fringe FM. Come, walk through the mossy creek and up the hill. Never mind the flashing lights and otherworldly shadows. They stay hidden within the trees. Come, step up to the shack and begin your journey to the answers that you seek. This is Lady Anne, and you are listening to Lighting the Void on the Fringe. FM. You are listening to the Fringe FM, and I'm Michael Deacon reminding you, you can find my show right here on the Fringe FM every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, or by going to michaeldeacon.com. The choice is yours. From the kingdom of Arkansas, you are listening to Joe Root and Lighting Void here on the Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. OMG, people are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your Super Strength Cleansing Tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. So, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com for super strength tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Get the tea.com, the tea that makes you go. The night is young, so turn up the heat with your host, Joe Root, on Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. 
We all have that story to tell in our lives. The winds were howling. The ground shook. You could hear rushing water. And then history repeats itself. When there's no power, refrigeration fails, doors with their shelves strip bare, ATMs can't operate, deliveries stop, then what? These events can last days or weeks. You need a plan. In statements made during recent interviews, FEMA Administrator Brock Long has repeatedly urged all Americans to understand three truths. FEMA is broke. The system is broken. If this is the new normal, Americans can't rely on federal cavalry when disaster strikes. Don't get caught out in the elements empty-handed. Prepare with us by going to preparewiththefriends.com and get your two-week food supply, 92 servings, eight food varieties with 25-year shelf life, normally 137 now only $75. Or get a month's supply, normally $247, now only $147 shipped in one business day. Just go to preparewiththefriends.com or call 888-440-7931. That's 888-440-7931. Get this great offer and be prepared while it lasts. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot never before witnessed. Each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand-illustrated, cover-to-cover with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork. The newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box with its own travel pouch, the Shadow Light Tarot Premium Deck and its Travel Size Mini Deck Wonderlight Tarot are both available now from WakingCanvas.com. If you use the code word FRINGE, that's F-R-I-N-G-E at checkout, you'll receive an extra 10% off your entire order. To discover more, including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork, make your way over to WakingCanvas.com today. That's WakingCanvas.com. From the kingdom of Arkansas, you are listening to Joe Root and Lighting Void here on the Fringe FM. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion tonight with Ian Wilson, uh, man. I got to get back on my dream stuff, Ian. Uh, for real. I just tend to zonk out after the show. Do I do work after the show and just tend to zonk out and don't get to do all this fun stuff. But URDreaming.org is the website. We're going to take our first caller here in this last part. It looks like 602 area code. Who are we speaking with, by the way? Howdy, Joe and Ian. This is Vaughn from Phoenix. Hey, Vaughn. Um, I just thought called in because i'm really impressed with you on um i believe the way you're talking about since i was about in my mid-20s but i really don't usually talk to it about other people because i reach this stuff point and maybe you can help me with it sure um specifically specifically um uh, when you get to the point where um you have to accept we are all one, and that means that we are equally capable and probably have committed very heinous acts and um, genocide, you name it. Just pick a, pick a subject, and they say, I cannot go along with that. There is no way I can accept that I was any part of that. And if you can't accept that you're part of the whole you reject part of it, and that just um, totally negates anything you're trying to tell them after that. They just won't accept it at all. Any feedback? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, when we're looking at this interconnected system is, you know, there's, there's no doubt when I look at things in my past lives that there are definitely lifetimes that, you know, and this is the world, you look at look at humanity right? We're a part of this humanity and we're all contributing to it in this interconnected system. So, you know, in the bigger picture, yeah, I mean, you know, there's going to be lifetimes that you're going to look at that you won't be so proud about for sure if you come back to it. And they may be completely hidden from you right now because you're not ready to deal with that and you're not at the maturity level anyways to deal with it. And that's why I think a lot of it gets hidden. We do come from dark places in this system, but we also come back to the light. We also come back to love. 
So, but that's part of the learning process to have that contrast so that you really do know the consequences of what your actions are and that they are weighted in consequences when you come from that place where there isn't any love. And that's why love in the system yeah, is, you know, what's, what it's really all about. I'm just wondering if there's any way that I can um, make people aware of this and enlighten them without breaking their spirit. Because that's the that's the bridge they cannot cross. Sure, but the thing is, each person it, has to come through their own process of self edification. It's a tough one, and I struggle with it too, because this system is like a school. We're all students of the self, which means we're all learning by being a part of a self in this system, and so we self edify. We come into our knowing. We come into our truth. All we can do is try to guide people by having conversations like this and not everybody's going to be ready and you can't force anything on a person anyways, but you have to do trust that this system is evolving there. Yeah. It is. And, and, uh, we are going to come out of it. I mean, if I'm correct on this end game that I observed at the Monroe Institute where we all come and have evolved to these beings of light, then all of this contrast of, what we've seen in our history and have been a part of has contributed to our evolution so that it it's called, I look at it as saying stopping those patterns of abuse is a very big way of looking at it, that we do learn and stop patterns of abuse. Where are you calling from, okay, Vaughn? I guess I hear what you're saying. Uh, I'm calling you from Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix. And yeah, um, yeah I, I understand what you're saying, Ian. Maybe it's me who can't accept that they're not ready. Uh, it's anyway, tough thanks because thanks for having them on, Joe. Yeah, thanks for listening, Thank brother. You, I really appreciate it. Thank, good call. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's true. It's uh, hard to go and have the expectation that you can help some people because sometimes that person needs to help themselves, right? And uh, no well, matter because, what you, you know, say, if they're not ready, they may not ever come to accepting that. But that's fine you know we talked about this last habits. week too but kind of from the other side of it ian where uh, carl young speaks about the shadow and jordan peterson's went on about this as well where we'd like right. to point our fingers and say look at that murder and rapist and look how mean or negative that person is we would never do that i, I would never do that well the truth of the matter is is you're actually pointing at something that you don't like about yourself and that yeah. you would in fact do that there, you know, when my cousin was in prison, I used to go to, uh, visit my cousin in prison twice, like at once every or twice a month. And he's not the kind of guy that, that you would ever think would have been locked up, but he got caught in the wrong time, wrong circumstance. And there he was. And you talk to a lot of people that end up in prison that have done things, bad things. If you sit down and you listen to the whole story, you can see that. Sometimes they were crimes of passion. Sometimes they were, well, you know what I mean? They were, there were the circumstances were there. What I mean is, is tomorrow, you, you could point your finger at somebody and say, I would never murder a person. Tomorrow, when you wake up, if the circumstances are just right, you might actually, actually get to see if you would murder somebody. You might actually get tempted with that. You might do it, even though it's not in your nature, because we all have that shadow inside of us that's capable of these things until it's gone, I believe. Yeah, well, the thing with that too, like, I mean, we can go back to me shooting a bird as an example of maybe the shadow self at work there. But of course, when you go through that empathy and have a connection to something bigger than yourself, um, it can definitely cure you of, because I can tell you this much, um, for me in my lifetime, I have no intentions of ever hurting anybody because right. I mean, it hurts me. Like, I, I mean, even when I, I break a heart with, a, I'm in love with somebody and we split up and, and I've hurt them. I feel that hurt and I feel really terrible about it. And that's honestly a tough thing for me. I don't like hurting anything. I don't even like stepping on bugs. Like, and it's you just, dodge, you dodge just, animals like I do when they come out yeah, in the road. You <laughs> believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Dodging frogs. Um, I try to minimize my load on the system is what I call it. I don't want to put a lot of load on it. I don't want to hurt it, you know, cause I do love this world. I mean, I think we're amazing. People are amazing. We're amazing beings. We're a miracle that we exist at all. 
So I don't want to take that for granted in myself or in other people. But that doesn't mean everybody shares that same perspective and opinion. So I could go out in the street and sure, I've been assaulted before. And, you know, you, I meet people that are very rude and not nice, but that's humans. I mean, that's, you get used to it, right? But you'll meet nice people. You'll meet amazing people. And so I don't really let it get to me. But for sure, we're all vulnerable. <clears throat> Look at John Lennon, you know, he was passing off some real nice, kind messages to people and what happened to him, right? Yeah, You know, what a terrible right. fate. All it takes is bumping into that one wrong person and you just don't know. And it's sad that they make that choice to hurt somebody else, but they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. It's like Jesus said, you know, Father, they don't know what they're doing. It's so true. <laughs> you know, that is such a big truth. People really don't know the damage they're causing. And it's, it, it will come back to them that they'll have to reconcile it and... Like I said, I've seen it in the system, you know, what you do to others, you do to yourself. That's a big yeah. truth and it should be written somewhere. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, off. if you're a spiritualist, like you've probably read conversations with God, most people have, where Neil Donald oh, yeah. Walsh claims he talked to God and <clears throat> it's a pretty profound book. The first one, it's funny though, what he says is, uh, about martyrs like Jesus or John Lennon or these type of people. He said, you know. Uh, Neil asked God, he said, so why don't we do this? He said, well, it's a, it's a funny thing that you do as humans. First, you don't want to accept the change or the evolution. And you point your finger at them and you say, it's them that has the problem, not us. And then once they see that, you know, uh, that they're going to keep talking their truth, like John Lennon or, or JFK or whoever, uh, then we get mad. We become angry and we kill them. And then once we see that they die and they're not afraid of death, then we make heroes out of them. We love them afterwards or even make religions out of them. And it's a cycle that we keep perpetuating. And for well, massive pattern, you, evolution right? <laughs> to happen, we need people that come down here every now and then to just change the game. And they know they're going to die for it, you know. But like I said, you know, when you see the bigger picture, there's really no true death. There's the shedding of a one pattern of experience to the next. So, you know, I'm very confident having gone through what I've gone through, through my epiphanies and my experiences and coming from another lifetime. Um, all it's done is just taught me, you know, the value of life and the value of us. So, you know, if somebody wants to shoot me for caring and being kind and compassionate and loving, well, that's okay. I don't think we're going to do that anymore, though. I think we've passed that. <laughs> I hope so. Um, uh, it's very rational to go and hurt people that are, you know, trying to care and trying to make the world better for their family and their friends' family. And we I, we do, as a community, do pull together. I mean, everything, it's just some people, some people, unfortunately, are very lost. And, and uh, you mean, I see where it comes from, you know, a lot of belief in evil, belief in you know, dark things can take you on a dark path. And, you know, I don't court the shadow self. I know better. Uh, you know, I don't go out there and chase, like I've had lessons, like don't be a victim of your desire. It was an inner, very powerful lesson for me. Yeah. It took me a long time to understand what that meant, you know, and that's the consequences, right? Understanding the weight of consequences in this system is very real. It's not something to play in. And, you know, when you understand that there's also benefits, you start working more towards those benefits, but those benefits come down to, for me at least, you know, being kind, being compassionate, being nice. But uh, again, you know, I'm just, like I said, an average Joe that works a job, has a family. I don't really make that much of a big impact in the world that way. But, you know, they teach that you know, in Freemasonry too. Actually, that desire is the one thing that you need to master. Right. Because oh, sure. des desire only begets more desire. Doesn't it can be nasty. At least it can lead you down one hell of a dark road. Yeah. Right. But here's the kicker, yeah, right? You say we're all going to evolve into these life beings. I got one for you or light mm -hmm. beings. Excuse me. What about somebody say like uh Hitler? You telling me that mm -hmm. he's going to end up as a light being after he's Might done. Take what him, he's done? Could, could take him a million lifetimes of reconciliation. Like, I don't know the, the full scope of how bad it gets when you do these terrible things to to others. And I just know from glimpses that, you know, I've seen how in myself from certain lifetimes that it did definitely flip roles, you know. Um, but 
I haven't, I mean, there's a lot of information there. I, I still have a lot of work to do to try to come into a bigger picture. I mean, everything we do is being parsing data in little chunks, right? Everything gets serialized into time. So it takes time to crawl and dig and climb out of the mires of belief into knowledge. I mean, it's a, I think it's a constant process while you're here to evolve. It's not easy. It takes work and discipline. <laughs> and sometimes I, sometimes yeah. I just get caught up in the whole, you know, nine to five thing. That's a big problem that I get too. It's like, oh my God, I got to work today. I got to do the grind, you know? And, uh, that's like it is for our, a lot of us. It's just, um, an enduring experience. But like I said, I get to close my eyes and go on adventures that I enjoy that, you know, I feel pretty spoiled with the dreaming stuff for sure. I look at that as my playground and I've, I mean, there I can literally have anything I ever want to have. I mean, you look at how I can do genre specific lucid dreaming and I can be in the world of star Wars or recreate, you know, ice cream. You uh, told me last time you wanted to taste a certain ice cream and you created that dream so you could taste it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of cool because before I could taste in dreams, I remember the first time I actually tasted something in a dream was actually hot chocolate. And I was thrilled because it was the first time I actually managed to get that sense working in the dream state and it tasted amazing. It was hot. And yeah, so the, the rewards, the intrinsic rewards of developing, um, and improving the atrophy that we have with perception, it's just been super rewarding. And, um, a lot of times when I dream, I I make a time in the dream just to observe and admire the dream, you know, and I put that in my journals as well. Like I try not to let the drama of the dream get me either. And, uh, you know, but what can you do? It's just a ongoing process that we're all part of. It's, I, I don't think we're ever going to see a true end to, because that immutable self, like that's the one thing that I've learned about all these different lifetimes is that in that there's this immutable self, the true you, the part of you that um, is that eternal or absolute self, you know, that can take on all these different roles, but always have a sense of your own identity as self. I mean, it's a complicated thing to explain, but it's the one thing that doesn't change amongst the lifetimes. There is a persistent self that's there. So I call it the immutable self is my term for it. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Going back to the chat here, going to hit up a few more questions. Um, What about meeting other people in dreams? Now, you told us last time that you did this, if I'm correct, right? Didn't you, you could actually pull this off. Yeah, well, um, it's tough to do because, again, we're fairly dream illiterate. So it takes a lot. It takes that other person having memory when they wake up. A lot of people don't. Most people don't. But I find people that are more prone to remembering their dreams tend to open that opportunity. Um, I know I have it on my website where I have one where I captured an example of a shared dream. Um, But again, for me, you know, that's I see that as a bigger picture kind of evolutionary process for all of us. But again, we're not going to get there if people, oh, that's impossible. That can never happen or never try, right? It's in the doing of these things that we seem to find the results. But I've shared dreams with people where they've remembered. And like I said, why the validation comes is because they can remember parts of the conversation. Dreams work in symbolism. So that unique, allegedly subjective symbolism is observed from their perspective in the dream as well as mine and can be discussed. So I've had a lot of good validation where I'm fairly confident that those are sincere shared dreams and not with just one person. So did the other people crop- remember them? Yeah, because they remembered. And that's the only reason why there's times where I've had information about people. They didn't remember. They told me in a dream and then I would tell them the dream and that information. And they'll be like, I've never told anybody that. How did you know? Uh, you told me in a dream, <laughs> you know, so that's a very other really unexplored part of us is, is that interconnection, like I said, and it's come through in my dreams, but not as much as I would like it to. It's another very rare thing. I mean, it would be nice if it was consistent, but I don't think we're all collectively ready for that yet, but it does definitely show its potential. Maybe one day. Man, that would be great. Uh, you know, yeah, I think Matt, yeah, cause Look, I'm a big fan of Monroe. I told everybody that. In his third book, Far Journeys, or Ultimate Journeys, he talks about beings that he met that could literally, and I don't know how true this is, but based on what Robert said, you got to give the guy some integrity, uh, that he met beings that could leave a human body 
on planets like ours, but were perfect, almost like the Garden of Eden type perfect, but they were capable mm -hmm. of leaving their bodies, say, under a tree in an unconscious sleeping state like we do, go travel as long and as far as they wanted to, and come back and just enter those bodies anytime they wanted to. Now, that's pretty trippy, just so they could have a physical experience. That's all it was for. Mm -hmm. That's kind of backwards well, than what we think. Though. We, kind of, we kind of do that already. I mean, he's describing it where now it becomes the norm. Right? That's right. Yeah, that there was that's but, people understood that they were spiritual, uh, non-physical right. beings and that it was backwards where the human body was used as almost like a dream state or a fantasy getaway. Mm -hmm. That's pretty trippy. Um, he also talked about how he could enter into his other lives, like a parallel life where he would re-enter himself a different way and he would end up living out a life with another family and stuff and that he could escape that too. And it really gets just perplexing after a while, but it's, it's fascinating stuff. Well, I know for myself, I mean, when I've had dreams where I'm not, cause it, you can definitely step out of your personality and your ego and your identity as what you are right now and become other characters in your dream. You don't have to dream as yourself. And I've done that as well. I have talked to people that have contacted me over the years to, to say things like, you know, I got dream locked and I was in a dream that lasted an entire lifetime. <laughs> I get this guy that's been parked behind me now. <laughs> parked here, he just <laughs> beams on. That's the, you know, that's funny. He's probably wondering what I'm doing, but whatever. You know, just Very stick rapid. your head out the window and tell him you're on a radio show. You ain't moving. You know, that's what you ought to do. Oh, Are you really going to uh, do I that? Think he's... No, no. That would be good radio. Kind of curious. All right, so I I keep having this dream <laughs> that I'm on a golf course, man, and I'm telling you, it's it's like a, it's I know that sounds crazy, but it's like a cosmic golf course that I end up going to, this place. Mm -hmm. uh, I I am very familiar with the people there, the people that are playing golf. It, it's almost like a heavenly golf course. I don't know why it's a golf course, by the way. I like golf, but not that much. Um, but yet I end up back there several times. I've even caught myself before waking up kind of descending, so to speak, from this place. And there are characters and faces of people that I know who they are. They feel like uh, more familiar than you and I feel right now. But I've never seen them in this life. And this is something that has been recurring to me over and over again. And no matter how many times I try to recall it, that's all I get. Played golf for a little bit, couldn't find this or that. Saw this guy, he looks like this. Don't remember what his name is, but I know I know him. And it's happened to me several times. What do you I think encountered that? that as well. Actually, my just my recent dream journal entry, which is a video, I actually talk about that because I bump into a person that I was driving in a truck with, and I didn't recognize that person from my waking life, but I recognized him from other dreams in my dream life. And it's an inter interesting thing about how our memory inverts because, like, we completely forget in a dream that we're even in this body. It's kind of funny. Like, when you're in that dream, you're not thinking about yourself on the bed. You're no. really immersed in that experience, but you're also having memories there that are relative to that dream experience because there can be persistent dream states, right? I've had persistence. I know people that work exclusively with persistent dreaming, meaning they're always going back to the same kind of world or dream world that they've been working with, right? Hmm. So, but the thing with memory is like when you leave that place and you come back here, now you're focused on here because this is what's relative to you right now. All that over there is kind of set aside. And that's that interesting way our memories invert and get into amnesic states. Uh, we seem to get really caught in the focus of the now and this present moment. And that's why I'm saying breaking immersion along the way is really useful to start seeing that you're this larger entity, that you're this dreamer, this like getting to know your dreaming self is a huge thing, like that you have this ability to think in reality, you know, that you can create dream reality just by thinking about it. It's pretty darn amazing. And we all do it but we don't look at it that way. Yeah, this man, that's trippy. Well, look, we got to roll out of here, man. This has been one hell of a show. Uh, you all need the website is you are uh, If everybody goes there, this is something that you post to, uh, frequently. Actually, you put your dreams mm -hmm. in there. Some of the stuff we talked about last time where you manifested things into physical reality, uh, like triangles, there's all kinds of stuff on this website and this is your baby, right? This is where everybody needs to go. Yeah, by what? I usually get an average traffic of maybe three people a day. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Everybody needs to go check it out, though. And see, that's the thing, man. It's like I find this stuff all the time, actually. 
really good stuff that's not being utilized um, the way it should be. Your website's one of those places. So hopefully it'll get more traffic, man. You know, more traffic I'll than you're experiencing right now on the street. I don't worry about it. My my whole thing is I don't make everything about me for sure. And if people find a value in it, then that's wonderful. Because anything I can do to help you, Joe, and help your listeners, that's what I'm about. I'm about people helping people. You know, where we come into this genuine honesty that, hey, you know, we're all in this together, man. We're all rocking this boat. So let's just do the best we can to get to the best knowledge and get to the best truth so that we can step forward. You know, I'm all well about said. that. Well said, sir. Ian Wilson was our guest tonight. The website, youaredreaming.org. Go check it out. Hit them up. Let them know what you think. You could probably ask him some questions there as well. We've got to roll out of here. The Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable is up next. We did manage to get way up there on TalkStream Live tonight, so I know this was a good show. Uh, don't forget that this show was produced by The Fringe FM. Please don't copy it, especially on YouTube without written permission. Music was by Chronox, guitar by Gunton Bundy. Special shout-out to our producer, Pacho, Patrick Newland, and uh, Don, Dennis, all of you guys in the chat room, the Void Walkers and their Eric Markham, program director, Jeremy Scott. See you guys tomorrow night, same time, same channel, right here on The Fringe FM. Good night. staff. Listener discretion is advised.